Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to the Arabic Unlock podcast, a podcast by people who love Arabic for people who want to learn Arabic. I'm your host, Asad Masoud, and today, mashallah, we have a very special guest with us. He is an Arabic teacher, a former Arabic student, a speaker of multiple languages, and the newest member of the Arabic Unlock team. We have with us our dear brother, Ustaz Sam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu feekum, Akhi. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. On this Likewise, it's, it's an absolute joy to be in the north, in the, in the homeland, the place of origins of Arabic unlocked. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So, speaking about Arabic, um, Arabic has a specific role, doesn't it, to play in your journey to Islam? Uh, tell us a bit more about that, inshallah. Definitely. I, I don't think it would even be a, an overstatement to say that Arabic was part of what brought me to Islam. Like, really, when Allah mm. subhanahu wa ta'ala um was was generous enough to offer me guidance to offer me guidance to islam like it was really like the arabic language and the eloquence of the quran was a huge part of that but before i say anything else about that though i, I really like before i start talking about my journey to islam i really like to remind myself and, and the audience as well that this really isn't a journey about me like i really like to frame this as it's really a story about the quran like if i was to write my journey to islam i'd write it, like the Quran would be the main character. Like I'd really see the Quran and perhaps even the Arabic language specifically as as the protagonist of that because like that it had a massive impact on me ever since I first heard Bismillah rahman rahim and Alif Lamim and heard these sounds like Saad and Qaf and Dab. Like the eloquence of the Quran played a massive part in my journey to Islam. De mm -hmm. Definitely. So tell us a bit more about that. What was it about the eloquence of the Quran or the Arabic language that took you from? not being a Muslim, to looking into Islam, to eventually accepting Islam? Yeah, like I, I, I come from a place where I didn't hear many other languages spoken growing up. Like I grew up in a home where English, where only English was spoken. And although I grew up in a county in Cornwall where there is a second language, Cornish is a second language there, but it's it's not widely spoken. Like whenever we reference it, it's very tokenistic. If you if you have the pleasure of driving to Cornwall ever, you'll see a sign that says, welcome to Cornwall in Cornish and mm. stuff. But it's very kind of tokenistic really. But I remember when I was about 17, uh, we had this school exchange to New Zealand. And when I went to New Zealand, I heard loads of different languages. Like I, I remember at our um, at our kind of welcome ceremony when our students from the UK came. They were firstly, they performed the haka. Um, if you're into rugby and you've ever watched the New Zealand mm. All Blacks perform the haka. So that was kind of part of it. And then there was other exchange students from China and Japan. And in New Zealand, they learn those languages in school, like the way we do German and French and Spanish. They do Chinese and Japanese. If you think about where New Zealand is, it just makes more sense for them. And I remember seeing Chinese come out of this white person's face. I remember like it was one of the sixth formers or something, whatever they call it there, like welcoming the Chinese students in Chinese. And I, I really, at that point, I really became just amazed with the sounds that humans make. Mm. Right, like there's even um, there, there's an ayah in Surah Al-Rum as well, isn't there? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ وَالسِّنَاتِكُمْ وَالْوَانِكُمْ. There's a that there's an ayah that there's a sign in that in the differences in our, in our languages, and um and that was something that really resonated with me even before I heard it. It was just something that when I saw people speak Chinese, even people who aren't from that background, I thought that was something really amazing. So when I came to listen to the Quran, this was a this was like a miracle from a language perspective of how beautiful it is. But it was something in between language and what I had come to know as just music, like in something mm. with melody, like melody really, before you know the Quran and you know like poetry and stuff, melody really kind of means music to most people, doesn't it? Mm. And the Quran was, there was something in the middle. Like I, I, I knew that it would change my life. Like from when I put those headphones on and I heard whether it was Abu Bakr al-Shatri, I, I don't remember the exact um, Qari who was reciting, but um, I, I knew it changed my life. Like I, I knew that listening to the melody of the Quran would change my life. So it was an absolutely massive part of my of, of my journey to Islam for sure. Um, yeah, and that was kind of how it came about. That was kind of, you know, Allah put some journeys in there for me where I heard other languages be spoken, and and I was able to appreciate the Arabic language as a as um as a level above um, all of these things I'd heard before. I suppose. Mm. So you grew up. I'm assuming just speaking English. Yeah. And then, which languages were you exposed to in New Zealand? You said Chinese. Uh, what else? Uh, so, yeah, so at, at the school that I went to, I went to um, Rotorua Boys School. Um, as the kind of taught languages, they teach Chinese and Japanese, but they also do Spanish as well. But they do Spanish from a younger age because okay. Spanish has the same vowels as the Maori language. Um, yeah, so so there's the Maori language, which is like the indigenous New Zealand language mm -hmm. um, before settlers came. 
And uh, yeah, Spanish and Maori have have a lot of similarities, I suppose, in their vowels is the main thing. Um, yeah, so I heard people speaking Maori, heard people speak Spanish, and um, like Spanish is something more familiar to us in Europe anyway. But it's seeing people who weren't Chinese or Japanese speaking those languages was um, was something I thought was just really um, inspiring, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, especially when the first time when when you're so accustomed to one thing or one way of being, uh, hearing white people only speak English, for example. Uh, yeah, I can imagine the feeling of seeing somebody speak Chinese and that kind of thing. Um, so you said you, you were studying in these classes where they were teaching English, uh, sorry, Japanese and Chinese and uh, Spanish. No, my, like, the amount of time I was there for, like a few months, the, the school didn't see that there would be a big payoff, really, in me learning mm. Chinese or Japanese. But, but um, yeah, I mean, when I f- it was kind of on that trip where I kind of first developed a love for languages. Um, right. Someone who came on that trip as well was a, a Spanish guy who was completely bilingual. I remember him picking up the phone to his dad and speaking Spanish to his dad. And people who grow up in big cities, like um, with lots of people from other countries, it's quite normal for them. They're probably used to going to like, their friend's house and their friend speaking mm-hmm. in Jabi or Urdu or something with their mum or their dad or whatever. But that was really new to me. That was a completely new experience, seeing someone chatting to me in English like this and then picking up the phone and switching mm-hmm. seamlessly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, so I so I so I was exposed to that. And um, what was the question, by the way? Remind me what it was. I went on some tangent. Uh, just if you'd be, if you'd studied these uh, languages in yeah, school. Yeah, right, but... right. Yeah, no, no. At, at the actual school, they they didn't see it as um, for the short amount of time we we're going to be there. Like, yeah. I'm not sure how much Chinese you learn in a few months doing. Yeah, it probably not a lot, uh, especially depending on how it's taught as well. But mm. uh, that leads on to the next question, which is: Okay, you were exposed to these languages at a young age. Um, you said you developed this love for languages, and then. Between, so I'm assuming you're in high school age. Yeah, it's about 14, 15. 14, 15. Like when was your first exposure then to the Arabic language? That was that would have been a few years later. Okay. Um, at that point, I was sort of dabbling in languages learning. The term language dabbler is like something that lots of people are familiar with. Like lots yeah. of people, they kind of get excited about learning a language and then they'll dabble in it for a while and learn a few phrases and, mm. and whatever. And that was really what I was like. Because... I had input from lots of other people, but no real strong reason to learn one. Mm. Like if I had one language in my family, I'd have had a strong reason to to stick to one. But I was in an environment with nobody other than just English speakers growing up. So Mm. um, dabbled in Chinese. Um, My auntie um, worked for Google at the time, and she told me that she went to this conference with the founders of Google. And um, one of them gave the advice that if they were to give any advice to their grandchildren, it would be learn Mandarin Chinese. Mm. And so I, I, I kind of took that at the time and that was the best I had. So dabbled in Chinese a little bit. Um, Spanish, I found to be really accessible for English speakers. Mm. I think it might be um, perhaps perhaps after British Sign Language, because that's sort of based on English. I think Spanish might be what, one of the most easy languages for an, for an English speaker to learn, perhaps. Mm. But it also depends on how it's taught. Like Arabic can be easier than sign language if it's taught better yeah do, do, do you know what i mean if yeah, sign yeah. language is taught badly so lo- lots of it's actually to do with the teaching strategy yeah we'll come to we'll come to this discussion point in a minute because uh yeah how languages are taught uh especially historically is probably a big reason why people have had bad experiences and like have very negative uh baggage in their mind about languages but um just continuing this point then about learning arabic or your exposure to arabic so you exposed to the arabic language i'm assuming the language and also the Quran um, after hearing the Quran. Or was your exposure to the Arabic language through the Quran? Yeah, or? so I suppose I left a little bit of a gap there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'd kind of dabbled in languages till I was about 16. 16 here in the UK, um, you get to choose what, what we call A-levels here, right? Yeah. And I was able to do Spanish then. But the thing is, right, like when I was at school, I was so bad at languages. I actually, still today, I don't have a languages GCSE. I don't have a high school qualification mm. in languages. Because and that was really rare when when I was at school. Like it was it was mandatory for everybody other than people who were absolutely terrible mm. um, to do a GCSE in either French or German. But I was one of the people who qualified as being terrible enough at languages that I went to college and had to look for any course that they would teach from scratch. And uh, yeah, lots of colleges do what they call Italian um, ab initio, where you can start from scratch, or Spanish ab initio. So they let me onto the Spanish one. Um, mm. Yeah, so I was able to do a Spanish A level. And then in that two-year period, that's when I kind of first started learning about Islam. It was in my first year. Actually, so I'd have been 16 at the beginning, but I turned, turned 17. Um, yeah, and I had this amazing assignment for, from my lecturer where she um, she thought it'd be appropriate for students to sort of experience listening to the Quran, experience what Muslims would experience. Because I was studying studies of religions. It wasn't just like a random part of the studies. 
Um, and, and as part of that, we were sent a link to listen to Quran Explorer or whatever the website was there. Now we do all on YouTube and stuff, don't worry mm. about it. Um, but then there, it was Quran Explorer. And I remember getting home and, you know, flicking through the different chapters that there were. I didn't quite understand why one was called a bumblebee and why one was called an elephant and stuff. Or the why some, and, and a cow. Yeah. <laughs> like, I didn't understand why some were really short and some were, you know, 20 pages long. I didn't, I didn't understand any of that. But what we do in our culture when we approach literature is we always start from page one and but perhaps it comes from reading the Bible, doesn't it? Like the Genesis at the beginning is like in the beginning there was this. Mm. And then the book of revelations at the back is like all the wacky stuff near the end of times. But, um, so I approached the Quran like that. So I opened it up chapter, chapter number one of Fatiha that ended quite quickly. And then I got into this sort of two or three hour listening to sort of Al-Baqarah. Mm. And it's kind of, it's interesting for me to think about why did I listen to all of it? I kind of, even from the beginning, had like a reverence for, for the Muslims and their religion. Just from, I just, it weighs heavy on you. Like lots of people have said this to me, people who have become Muslims or people who have learned about Islam. It weighs heavy on you. Like Allah really tells you. Allah doesn't mince his words in the beginning, beginning of the Quran. This is the book in which there's no doubt. It's for people who are conscious of Allah. Like Allah is not trying to sell you the Quran in the beginning, like, oh, please become a Muslim. You know, your life will be better. You'll earn more money or something. There's none of that. Like Allah just... Allah tells you the truth and it weighs heavy on you, right? Mm. That this is a thing that's true and whether you're going to accept it or not. And I, I suppose I had a, even before meeting Muslims or really understanding the Quran, I had a certain reverence for it and I didn't want to pause it. I didn't know if it was like offensive to pause mm. in the halfway through a surah. So I was into like this three hour recitation of Surah Al-Baqarah. Mm. And throughout that time, I really fell in love with it. It really kind of gave me ease to my heart. And I, I, I don't, I don't quite know how to, explain that really but um i found it i found i found a, a tranquility in the listening to of the quran um purely just from the melody of it um yeah i remember uh, looking out of my window and in cornwall I, I had a real privilege to grow up in the countryside and look out of my window and see flocks of birds flying past my window all the time and i remember listening to a recitation of um uh surat mulk um and there's the ayah where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um mm-hmm. And that when when I heard the recitation of that, I think it was by um, Sheikh Maher al mm. He says mm. in a way that kind of matched the beating of the wings of the birds as they flew past me. Mm. I really just found peace listening to the Quran in the countryside in that place. Um, yeah, so I, I was about seventeen, I think, when I when I kind of went through this experience of really falling in love with the recitation of the Quran, coming home from college and saying hello to my dad, then going up to my room and listening to the Quran, and my dad would have heard me start trying to. Here at my bed, walk past my bedroom of her and heard me like someone book mm. or whatever. <laughs> It'd hear me walking past my room <laughs> reciting this of the Quran, mm. and that kind of opened the discussion with my family about Islam and what it is and and all that. But uh, you know, to to come back to the point though, that that was sort of that was really where I was first introduced to the Arabic language. And as I mentioned earlier, it was kind of before that, lots of language dabbling, not really any deep dive into a particular language. But at that point, I really had a reason for a deep dive. Yeah, so that, when I was in my bedroom listening to the Qur'an, that was, yeah, the first point when I really kind of fell in love with one particular language. And it kind of really gave me a, a good reason to go deep on one language in particular. Um, and at my college, I was fortunate that there was an Arabic course, like surprisingly, in a place like Cornwall, where mm. I, I don't believe I'd ever met an Arab. Um, I'd certainly never met a Muslim in my life. Or maybe I had, but I hadn't known. I hadn't met them as a Muslim. Mm. Like, but maybe I had met a Muslim. But, um, but at this stage of my life, I'd... I'd, I'd only really just met other white English or white Cornish people. Um, yeah, but I was, but in that location, you know, Allah, he put an Arabic course there mm. um, in that, in that college. So I had the opportunity to go and learn my first Alif Bata and learn some phrases. After you'd already learned Quran. <laughs> so after I'd already learned some Quran. Yeah. So that, that experience then in the Quran was really just me sat in my bedroom with my headphones on trying to follow along trying to literally do tilawa, like I'm literally trying to follow along with, with, with what the recitation is saying. And, um, and I found myself memorizing it. I didn't, at that point, I didn't actually even know that there's such a thing as like a half of the Quran. I didn't, mm. I didn't even know the Quran was to be memorized. But the same way that lots of people sort of listen to a song over again and they know the lyrics, like I'd, I'd enjoyed listening to the Quran so much. I even had it on. I don't know if you remember the little iPods that are like mm. this, sort of this big. Yeah. Apple came out with some, um, some ones that were colorful. I had a yellow one. And mine was just full of recitations of the Quran. 
And I used to walk and do my paper round, listen to the Quran around my village. Mm. <laughs> so, Maybe we've got iPod Nano or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah, one mm. of those. Well, those ones were tiny, yeah. yeah. But, but or I, shuffle even. They had the, the shuffles, yeah. so that's the one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I had one of the one of the yellow ones. It was about this big. That that feels like so long ago. Yeah. Subhanallah, you know. We didn't have smartphones and stuff even then. Yeah, it's fun. It makes it feel very old, ancient. But um, the so when you were listening to the Quran, were you following in uh, like the translation in English, or were you purely just listening to the Arabic? Most of the time, listening in Arabic. Okay. Most of the time. But this this process of me sort of spending a lot of time listening to the Quran and and even sort of um, indirectly memorizing the Quran, even that wasn't wasn't my main intention. That's kind of going along at the same time as me learning about Islam in my studies at college. So I was sort of learning about who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, um, like, you know, what Arabia was like, a little bit about that, like who the Quraysh were. I'm, I'm really grateful for that, that kind of education because I, I think lots of academic programs in schools in Britain probably wouldn't teach their students like who the Quraysh were mm. and how kind of, um, how revolutionary the idea of Tawheed and Islam was in, in Mecca at the time. And that was something we, we were taught. Mm. So I was kind of getting an understanding of the Quran from, from those classes whilst developing a love for it at home. Yeah, I mean, it, so far, it sounds like everything in your story is like upside down. So you, you learned to recite the Quran before you'd ever really studied it or read it in English. You'd learn to, you'd memorize some of the Quran before you're even a Muslim. You've been taught Islam, not from Muslims, I'm assuming, but from non-Muslims in a... Yeah in a school environment, um, yes, yeah, alhamdulillah. So from there, uh, keep taking us on the journey to at which point did you accept Islam um, and what was your relationship like with Arabic at that point? Mm. And then from there, uh, you, I mean, you can fill in the gaps either it was before or after, but when did you actually start studying Arabic? And Yeah, so, so I enrolled on the Arabic course that there was at my college. It was an evening course and it was taught okay. by a Lebanese woman. Uh, may Allah bless her. Um, yeah, may Allah reward her because she really went out of her way to kind of listen to my story and stuff. She, because when, when you turn up in a place like that, like we're all in Cornwall, most people there maybe have had a holiday to Morocco or something, but most of us don't have like Arab friends or Muslim friends, or whatever. It's just a classroom of white people. Mm -hmm. So you all kind of have your own reasons for being there. So when I was talking about my reason, um, yeah, so everybody kind of has their reasons, right, for being in a classroom like that. Like we're all people from Cornwall and, you know, it's not, kind of a typical interest of a Cornish person growing up in Cornwall, right? And when I was kind of telling my story of why I was interested in the Arabic language, this love that I had for the Qur'an, um, the sound of the Qur'an and the melody of it, and even like, I'd even like gone on YouTube and I was listening to like khutbas and Arabic poetry and stuff like that too. Like I, even outside of the Qur'an, like the Qur'an, as I say, is really the main character, but I even love just listening to the melody of the Qur'an, like the the beginning of the khutbas, in alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'in, you know, there's such a unique kind of melody and flow to um, to the Arabic language in general. But um, so as I was telling that story, um, the teacher, she really kind of, she she pulled me out of the classroom once to ask to speak to me and said, like, are you aware that we have a masjid here in Cornwall? Are you aware that there's a teacher there who has a jazzer and, and he can teach you Arabic and teach you the Quran and stuff like this? And um, up until that point, I've been aware of that masjid. I just hadn't, I hadn't really built the confidence to go to a masjid. And I, because I also had no Muslims around me, I had no one to tell me how important it was to go to a masjid and to take a shahada and stuff like that. Because the journey was all my own until that point. Like I'd really by that point come to accept Tawheed. I'd really at that point come to accept the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the final messenger. So, and that was all kind of done by myself. So I I didn't really the, the community aspect of Islam wasn't a huge part of my journey at that point. Mm -hmm. But um, I really trusted this woman. Um, so the next weekend, I found myself um, turning up to that masjid. I got there early, I remember. I remember waiting there and the, the, the Quran teacher, Abdul Salam, turned up. And I'd been practicing Assalamu Alaikum in my head. How do I say Assalamu Alaikum? And I remember once when I went to go, he said Assalamu Alaikum and I said Assalamu Alaikum. And I felt <laughs> awful. I was I, in the car, I was thinking, Does, do I have to take my shahada again? <laughs> like, have I made a big mistake? Is it offensive or something? But um, so anyway, so Abdul Salam turns up, um, who was my Quran teacher for a long time, even when I was at university. When I go back to Cornwall, he'd do durus for me and stuff like that. I'd sit with him, we'd recite the Quran together. I finished Juz Amma with him. Um, yeah, so we, we went into the masjid and we sat together and he taught me Surah Al-Fatiha, taught me, you know, lots of the short surahs from the end of the Quran so I could start praying. And, um, and I'd turn up and we'd like pray Dhuhr together and stuff. And it just kind of came up in a conversation later that I hadn't actually taken my shahada. 
Mm. Like I think so, like somebody else had come to the masjid and um, and said, so how long have you been a Muslim for? Like when, when did you take your shahada? I don't don't remember hearing about someone taking their shahada. And I was like, well, I haven't taken my shahada here. So of course they snapped up the opportunity mm. <laughs> to uh, for me to take my shahada then. So yes, yeah, so well I'd kind of I'd become a Muslim and I'd started this course, but when I'd started sitting with Abdul Salam so regularly and he started teaching me Arabic as well and started speaking some Arabic to me as well, um, I found that the the course I was doing at college, I just didn't really need it so much. I'd found like an Islamic environment when I was le- where I was learning the things I really wanted to. So, so I stopped doing that and I thought to myself, like, I don't know if I can live with myself as a Muslim without learning the Arabic language. Like I was in an environment in Cornwall, of course, where all my friends are non-Muslims. Like I'm, I'm constantly kind of trying to say the Quran doesn't say this. The Quran says this. People are coming to me and saying, oh, I've heard the Quran says this. And in that sort of environment, I didn't know if I could really be the representative for Islam that I wanted to be without learning the Arabic language. And having done loads of languages dabbling in my early teens, I didn't want Arabic to be like that for me. I, in fact, I couldn't live with Arabic being like that for me. And I, I knew that the best way for me to be a person who would learn Arabic would be to commit to Arabic. So I'd actually planned before that to be doing, to be going to university to study Spanish and English literature was my plan. And my Spanish teacher was livid when I told her I wanted to do Arabic. She was livid. Mm. <laughs> she was like, oh, at least do Spanish and Arabic, at least. And I was like, no, we're all in on this Arabic thing. Mm. So I kind of I made that decision um, quite early that, that I would do my, my, my degree in the Arabic language because most people really need that. Like Most people really need to commit to some kind of program. They need some kind of support for it. You know, lots of people can kind of spend their time trying to learn the Arabic language on their own. But um to be honest, us as humans, if we we really just need to admit to ourselves sometimes that we need some kind of structure. Mm. Like that that can look different. There, there are lots of different journeys that can take you on, but we, we really need some kind of accountability. We need some kind of structure. We, we need to commit ourselves to something. And for me, it made sense in that time of my life for it to be a degree program. So yeah, so I was, I guess, 17 at this point, applying for Arabic language degrees. And um, yeah, and I was accepted at a few, alhamdulillah. Um- so yeah, from, from what you were mentioning there, SubhanAllah, the theme of your story being kind of backwards <laughs> continues how you were in the masjid studying with uh, this uh, Imam Abdul Salam, I think you mentioned his name was. Um, you're learning Quran with him before you'd officially taken your shahada. Mm-hmm. But of course the shahada is, of course, believing in the statement of the shahada rather than just pronouncing it. Um, and also, SubhanAllah, the, the fact that you'd... I mean, you mentioned a few points that I just wanted to elaborate on. The, the point about dabbling uh, in languages. Uh, typically, it's because you haven't fully committed to it. And typically the reason for that is you don't have a strong enough why. So a lot of people, they'll try a bunch of languages. They'll have a burst of motivation. I don't know, a movie will come out in a language that's very popular. Uh, I think a few years ago, there was like a very, uh, I think a Japanese movie or something, one of, one of Oscars. And uh, loads of people I spoke to, oh, I'm going to learn Japanese so I can watch all the movies if they're all this good. Um, I don't know what the movie was and I haven't watched it. But um, that kind of thing where people get this sudden spur of motivation to learn a language. But it's one like it's not, long lasting compared mm. to what it sounds like you found with Arabic where you had a very solid reason for wanting to learn the Arabic language. On that point though, SubhanAllah, it's, it's somewhat that you seem to have decided or a conclusion that you came to before even accepting Islam. A lot of Muslims who are born Muslim to this day don't understand the importance of the Arabic language, especially being a Muslim, how, how it is central to that. So what, what kind of drew you to that conclusion? Um, the, the, the conclusion that Arabic was sort of central to, to my yeah. journey as a Muslim, you mean? That you, you felt like you needed it rather than it not being mm. something optional. Yeah. So the, the Arabic language is really like, it is like a miftah to our religion. You know what I mean? Like it, it really is. Like, I, I don't think you can have like a meaningful and direct relationship with the Quran or, um, you know, or any of our scripture or our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, without Arabic. You're, you're always going to be depending on, on what somebody else has said and, I really wanted to be a person who, when people came and challenged me about something that it says in the Quran, I would have the tools to be able to defend that. And I, I think living here in the West, that's a really important skill. Like, it's something that perhaps here in the West, maybe our Muslim community are the most negligent, perhaps, in terms of our striving to learn the Arabic language, compared to Muslims maybe growing up in other um, countries that don't speak Arabic. Like, for example, I live in Somalia, and people are really conscious of that Arabic is important part of our religion. Like they start learning Elif Bertha from when they're young children. And, and even Arabic is a language, I mean. I know even here, like we learn Elif Bertha in our madrasas, don't we? But um, so it was really obvious to me. It was really clear to me. And I also remember my first introduction to Islam was through the Arabic language. 
Whereas like, lots of people who maybe become Muslims or they grow up as Muslims, their first introduction to Islam is in another language saying it's time to pray mm. or in another language learning about some kind of story or some, something something else, right? But my my very first introduction to Islam is that this is a la- this is a religion conveyed through the Arabic language. You know, this this is this is the medium that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala chose His book for. So um, that was really apparent to me. That that was really clear to me. So so it, so your point on a why is really interesting. Like my why was really solidified at that point because it wasn't just about how cool Arabic is. It was about my identity and integrity as a Muslim. It was really tied into that. Mm. And I, well, when you were mentioning about the movie in Japanese or something, I was thinking that's just not a strong why. Because I thought you were going to use it as an example of a why, <laughs> right? Mm. Someone watching a movie and thinking that this is a good reason to learn a language. And I, I, you know, like, so us as Muslims or anybody who wants to learn the Arabic language, we should take a little bit more time to really think, what, what does this language mean for me? And get deep on that. Like, you know, in, in, in some of the books I've written in the past for learning the Arabic language, there have been kind of journal pages at the beginning for people to get deep on that. Like, how would learning the Arabic language change my life? What would, uh, how different would I be as a person? How different would I be able to project myself into the world as a Muslim? You know, and I think even one thing I've, I've heard among my students is that it gives people real confidence as a Muslim to be able to quote the Quran in Arabic. Mm. Like to be able to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this and actually say what Allah said and not say what a translation says or say some okay, rendition of what you think mm. it, it might say in the Quran. So I had a really kind of solidified why in mm. that because it was you know, it's integral to my identity, I suppose. Mm, yeah, subhanAllah. So going back now to your story then, um, so you had this why, you wanted to learn Arabic, you said you enrolled in a university degree course. Um, tell us a bit more about that, uh, what your what your experience was of learning Arabic through the degree and in general, mm. uh, kind of some challenges you might have faced along the way and that kind of thing. Yeah, so language Arabic language degrees in the West, typically you don't need any Arabic to start. Um, because we don't really have a structure here in the UK in our schools and our colleges to do like GCSE and A-level Arabic. They exist, but um, they're not kind of a, a very common and typical part of um, schooling here. Mm. So, the uni- so the university degrees accommodate that. So you could turn up and not know any Arabic. I knew a little bit of Arabic. I knew the script. I'd memorized by this point maybe two juz of Quran by this point when mm. I when I first um, first moved to London. Um, I knew like Kaif al Hal, you know, stuff like that. Like mm. just some basic muhadatha, some basic conversation. Mm. That was all I really had. Um, so the the Arabic degree, because you can start completely from scratch, you've got some catching up to do. Right. Most people who start like a Spanish degree or a French degree, they've done French since they were like eleven, yeah. maybe at school. So you've got those years, like maybe six years to catch up on. Mm. So they're they're really intense. So that's not something unique to SOAS where I went. Like if you do an Arabic language degree in the West as as a whole degree, it'll be really intense. And your first year is really just having Fusha be an interview. Like there, there should be very little discussion on those degrees. Well, when I say should, I don't mean from a value judgment. I mean, that's what you'll find is what mm. I mean. Very little focus on any dialects, very little focus even on like other topics, even as well, like Arabic culture and stuff like that. It will really just be like, try to learn a few hundred words a week. So you can read a newspaper. That, yeah. that, that's all the focus. Um, yeah, so the focus in, in an Arabic language degree, it's not going to be an Islamic one in the beginning. Um, yeah, terms like, like, like it's terms that we need for our basic Islamic studies, things like um, a metan and an isnad or something for studying a hadith or mm-hmm. things like that. Th- those aren't terms that you'll learn, but you will learn how to say um, like the, the mm-hmm. economic case. So you will learn how to talk about journalism and stuff like that in particular Arabic countries. So that's what the first year is. You do get one other module. I think I did Arabic culture or something, but that's really not a focus. You get maybe 25 hours of contact time a week and maybe one or two of them will be that other topic. Mm. But it is a good degree for that. Like, you know, a lot of university degrees, you can go and get like four hours of contact time a week. So mm. like, I think maybe English literature or history where a lot of your time is just reading. Um, you know, Arabic's not like that. It's really good if you want to get your money's worth. Mm. Like, especially now when we pay nine grand a year or whatever. Is it 20 grand a year or something by now? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. For our degrees here in the UK. So, yeah, it's, it's really good for that. People who really want their money's worth. I'd, I'd, re- I'd recommend an Arabic degree if mm. they're going to do that. I, I mean, say, speaking of degrees in general, it's kind of like the, this might be a bit controversial to some people, but obviously the value of a degree and how effective degrees are in, in terms of a, an education. I suppose... 
when it comes to language degrees, the proof is in the pudding. Like when you graduate, okay, you have a piece of paper, you got a first, but can you speak the language? Can you use the language? Whereas you could graduate with, I don't know, a degree in psychology and maybe have not that much knowledge of psychology, but you've got a paper that proves that, okay, I'm now qualified. Whereas I have met people who have master's degrees in Arabic who have very basic Arabic, mm. if barely functional, but they've got a master's degree in Arabic. Yep. Um, so yeah, something like language learning when it comes to university, I suppose the like I said, the proof is in the pudding at the end of it, whether you can actually use the language or not. I completely agree. Yeah. How did you find your degree program to be in terms of that balance between trying to get you the piece of paper versus actually teaching you the language? That's a really good question because I think if I look at my cohort of other people who graduated at the same time as me, I might be the only person using Arabic in my in my daily life, mm. like in terms of my work and stuff like that. And I I only do that because I built my own job. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like I like I didn't apply for a job that required me to speak Arabic. And I think that is the case for my entire cohort. I'm not aware of any of them actually use Arabic in their job. But like uh, there's one guy who I studied with in Palestine who's doing an Arabic degree with me. And he became really interested in Turkish when he was at university. He was Cypriot, um, Turkish Cypriot. And I think he works, he's like a Turkish translator or something now. So it, it, it's 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 proof that the proof is in the pudding, right? Isn't it? Mm. Like if you, because languages, there's no blagging a language. Like there's no... There's no improvising a language. Like mm. you turn up to a job interview, if you want to use Arabic in your work or something, you need to prove that you know Arabic. It doesn't matter if you've got a certificate, as you were saying. And something I actually found on my Arabic degree was when I was in my second year, I remember I met some brothers who had come back from Egypt. They'd been studying in Egypt for a year, I think. And I'd been doing Arabic at university for two years. And their Arabic was much better than mine. Mm. But their, their level of Arabic in terms of like being able to chat to Arabs in the prayer room and stuff like that was head and shoulders above mine mm. at that point. Obviously, I hadn't been to Palestine and stuff like that. Like they'd been living in Egypt for a year at least, I think. But it really made me think at the time that with languages learning, the, the proof really is in the pudding. And, and you can you can actually build that journey yourself. Like These guys weren't forced to go and learn Arabic. Mm. They really built this journey themselves. They thought Arabic is the important thing, so we will go and learn Arabic. I happened to be from like an academic and cultural background, I suppose, at a time where people who had, had good A-levels did a degree. Mm. Like that was kind of the the conversation that just kind of happened. But, you know, if I, if I was to go back and be 18 year old Sam, 18 year old Sam might have been able to achieve more in terms of the Arabic language with 18 months at a good institute in an Arabic speaking country, perhaps. Or, mm. or if I had like a well directed study program of some kind, I may have been able to learn more, mm. which is um, which is a really interesting point and something f for our listeners to think about, like what does their journey really look like for the Arabic language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, something we stress a lot as well is trying to figure out specifically where you're trying to head and then find the shortest route to that because with things like degree programs, I'm sure they have a broader spectrum of what they're trying to cover in there. Like you mentioned, they're talking about economics and stuff <laughs> yeah. like that. If your goal is to understand the Quran, for example, a lot of that is obsolete or unnecessary. Yeah. Now, if you have a broader goal of using the Arabic language for some kind of work or translation work, then of course that has a place. Uh, but even that perhaps is secondary to your primary goal of learning Arabic to understand the Quran. Um, so it normally makes a lot more sense to find the shortest path to whatever destination you're trying to reach. Mm. Um, that eliminates a lot of the unnecessary effort and time and, and sacrifice that you'll make for some of that. Yeah. Like, for example, when I look back on a, a high school education or school education, I think 90% of what we learn is completely useless or yeah. never, going to be, never going to be used in our lives. Um, for example, maths, I'm pretty sure the only maths that I use today is what I learned in primary school. Mm. Um, all the advanced uh, algebra and trigonometry and all this stuff, when, unless you're going into a field that uses that kind of stuff, it's, it's not useful on day-to-day -day basis. Um, do, you think, um, do you think there can be a problem in how we talk about languages learning, being very binary? It's like, do you speak Arabic or do you not? Definitely, so, yeah. There, yeah. There, there can be a real problem with that because people might have a specific goal for their language. Do you know what I mean? As, yeah. as you're saying, like pe people who are Muslims growing up in the UK or the USA or whatever, Australia, whatever, like they may, as you say, they may not care about a siesta. They may not care about politics. They may not care about yeah. economics or whatever in the yeah. Arabic language. And really their life and their relationship with Allah would be improved purely with something very specific. Yeah, you know, yeah you're yeah. absolutely right. Even in your mother tongue, if you think about it, how many times have you heard a word in English where you're like, what does that mean? Mm. Um, so then how do we speak English? Do we? Do we not know English? Like, uh, how does it qualify? Mm. Um, you know, you have like the European framework of uh, language prof proficiency. Um, typically, a native speaker sat at like a C1, B2 level, um, which you could say is like a, a seven out of ten. 
Uh, a 10 out of 10 is like advanced academic kind of language. The majority of the English speaking population are not at that level. Mm. They're the academics and they're the people who have PhDs and have been to university. So, yeah, like you said, what does it mean to speak a language or to know a language? Mm. Um, there's a level of um, there's a level of Arabic which, um, when I was writing the Arabic in sixty steps program and stuff, I kind of I, I came up with. I don't, I don't know if we really delivered it on on that program, but I, I came up with this term independence in language. So, I suppose you would have achieved language independence when you no longer need to rely on another language. If you know what I mean. So mm. you can't be expected to know all the vocabulary. Right. It's just uh, particularly in Arabic. If you look at some of the dictionaries like Tajal Arus and stuff, mm. you're not going to know all the vocabulary. Mm. Right. Native Arabic speakers don't. But you can get to a point where you can learn new vocabulary in Arabic, like you can use an Arabic to Arabic dictionary. Yeah. Or if you don't, if you hear something, you don't understand it. You can say or, or whatever right? Yeah. to actually get around it. Like, what does that mean? You can actually you, within the Arabic ecosystem, you can you can actually achieve that. And I, I quite like that idea. Um, I, I quite like it. For a student who does have more broader objectives in learning Arabic to to think about that term independence. Mm. Yeah. No, I think that's a very useful way to look at it, actually. Yeah. Um, so going back to your, your story now. Uh, so you've now learned Arabic, you've graduated from the degree. Um, you alluded to it now in terms of, uh, of course, you're an Arabic teacher and you've been teaching Arabic for a while. Take us, how did that transition happen? How did you start uh, with your teaching of Arabic mm -hmm. and then where did that lead to? You know, I, I don't think that there is a massive dichotomy between student and teacher. Like, just just like in kind of our Islamic studies, the, the talib al-ilm can pass on lots of ilm. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the student of knowledge, even like some of, some like most of the people who we even look up to would consider themselves talab al-ilm. Like they consider themselves students of knowledge themselves. And I, I think us Arabic teachers, we should we should kind of have that same ethos. You know, because I think even sometimes Arabic teachers might be embarrassed to say that they themselves have teachers. Like mm. sometimes it should be expected that, you know, mm. that you know enough to be a teacher. But that thinking is completely backwards, really. I think we we should we shouldn't really see a dichotomy between like, I was a student. And now I'm a teacher. It's really I'm just a, I'm a more advanced student mm. at, at this stage. And I suppose the skill of teaching in itself is a skill, isn't yeah. it? You, the, the becoming of a teacher isn't about advancing in your knowledge of Arabic, but it's it's about learning how to package that and present it to pe certain people. And I think, you know, throughout the early years of me first teaching the Arabic language, because I, when I graduated, I first went into being a primary school teacher, actually. That was my first role. Um, I didn't do that for very long, maybe six months or something. But I got quite good at unpacking concepts that people found complicated and explaining it to my classroom of seven-year-olds. And that was a really good practice for me. <laughs> not, not that my students are like seven-year-olds. But the going through that process of being able to unpack things for people as if they were seven year olds, because mm. I mean, there's lots of things that I'm like a seven year old in, in my mm. knowledge. There's really nothing wrong with that, yeah. <laughs> you know. So I think I I mean, I think there was a TV program called Are You Smarter Than a 10 Year Old or something? <laughs> and most of the adults who went on there were losing. So SubhanAllah. Yeah, not, SubhanAllah. Not Aren't there those like apps and stuff where you can you can like assess your brain age or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and some like adults are like have a brain age of like 12 or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how accurate they are, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, true. Fair enough. Well, well with yeah, so so where was I? So with me, I think at that stage in my career, when I've been teaching Arabic for a few years, and I started creating YouTube videos at this point as well. I really kind of prided myself on being able to communicate to people from a similar background to me. You know, like I think there's an issue in the space of learning the Arabic language for Muslims where there's often a disconnect between people who have the knowledge and people who can convey it. Like sometimes they're incredibly knowledgeable people. Like, mm. you know, we all know that there are there are Arabic language teachers out there or people who are like professors of the Arabic language, Arabic speaking universities who have access to what just they have computer brains of wealth of knowledge of the Arabic language. But they may not be the people who can present it in a way and package it in a way that's accessible to people here in the West mm. or Muslims living outside of the Arabic speaking countries. And I, I really acknowledge that. I realized look, so many parents of the children I was teaching particularly were saying, you know, we've got teachers who are really good teachers. They know loads, but they don't know how to package it for our students. And that, that's something that, that, that I really love about being part of Arabic Unlocked, actually, that. You know, we we sort of really pride ourselves at packaging the Arabic language in different methods as well. Obviously, we have our app, we have our academy and stuff. And, um, you know, I see a big part of my, my role here and the ethos generally for us Arabic Unlocked to be 
um, people who bridge that gap between people who really have that knowledge of the Arabic language and packaging it in a way which is accessible and interesting as well for people living here in the West. So, yeah, the, the, those are the things I'd say, I suppose, about the transition between student and teacher, if you can even call it that. Mm. I, I, I'm conscious that I'm quoting a lot of, referring to a lot of movies and TV programs in the podcast for some reason. But um, as you were saying that, it reminded me of, there's a movie called uh, Catch Me If You Can, I think it's called. I don't know if you've seen that never, one. Never, I've never seen it. Um, basically, he he's the, the the point I'm mentioning that's relevant to this conversation is he he goes into a school one day and he the teacher isn't in uh, and he's basically pretending to be the supply teacher and he just goes to the front of the class and he's like right we're gonna we're gonna learn this today and he opens the book and he quickly reads through the page and he starts teaching it and then basically everybody in this in the school the the management and the head teacher want to assume he's the the new teacher the supply teacher whatever. So when the actual supply teacher comes, he basically drives him away and he takes his job. And all he does is before the lesson, he reads the page ahead of the class okay. and then he teaches the lesson. Uh, and the point being made is that uh, sometimes you just need to know more than the person you're teaching. Like you said, you don't need to be, you don't need to have completed Arabic and got to 100%. Uh, you just need to be one step ahead of the person that you're teaching. Um, and, and sometimes, sometimes that if the gap is too big between student and teacher, it becomes too difficult to relate. Mm -hmm. um, imagine a, you know, a, a quantum physicist trying to teach science to seven-year-olds, like you were saying, yeah. he wouldn't be able to communicate and speak their language. Mm. Whereas a primary school teacher's knowledge of science is not going to be anywhere near Einstein's. Yep. But their ability to convey that to a, to a seven-year-old or to a child is going to be much better. So yeah, like you said, it's, it's that balance between the right amount of proficiency in the subject matter and then the ability to teach it and convey that message to whoever the, the student is. Sometimes it may even, as you say, it may even be, even be preferable to have, to have even learned that thing recently, sometimes in some yeah, cases. Yeah. Sometimes you need to have also been through the experience, of, experience that the student's going through because, mm -hmm. like you said, a lot of these, uh, there are a lot of, mashallah, um, very knowledgeable native Arab teachers of the Arabic language, but because it's their mother tongue, they'll never understand the struggles of, somebody who's learning it as a second language. Mm -hmm. Perhaps some of them, well, they will know a second language if they're teaching in English, but um, yeah, they just can't relate to, like to them, it's like, why, why is this so hard? Why is it so hard to go from Yadribu to Yadribuna? <laughs> like, you can, you can only understand that if you've had to learn that as a, as a second language. So do, as a teacher, do you ever kind of go through a process where you try to make yourself a beginner again? Like for example, at Jiu-Jitsu, do the black belts ever make you feel like a beginner? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I try and make a, a conscious point of, I enjoy learning new things anyway. So I'm always trying to put myself, not, not for that purpose, but I'm always finding myself in, in a position of being a beginner at a number of different things. So for example, I've uh, recently started studying French. Um, so now I'm back in the shoes of being a beginner language learning student. And uh, there's so many parallels between that and when I was learning Arabic that I can take from that experience and apply it to now. Um, but also, yeah, different might be sports, different skills, uh, yeah, being, being a beginner, there's a lot of parallels regardless of what you're doing. Um, and the journey typically looks very similar as well. Something I found, something I've actually did a couple of years ago, was that I had one of my students was on my intensive program who was starting right from learning Elif Berta. Like they had no Arabic whatsoever, complete blank slate. Mm. And I found myself getting frustrated with teaching the script. And then I remembered it's been over a decade since I learned a new script. Yeah. So I spent about a month or two maybe learning the Bangla script. Like I looked at the other languages in the world that have a script that's different to Arabic and which one of these is a community that I actually could practice this with and could I see regularly and stuff. And and I thought actually this, the, the Bangla script was probably one, like living in London and also in Cornwall, like our biggest Muslim community of the Bangladeshis. So it took like a month to learn the Bangla script. And that was a really, really good experience for me to actually be a beginner again in something so relevant actually to teaching the Arabic language. Because mm. the script particularly as well is maybe something we neglect. Like once it's kind of been learned, we think that just anybody could kind of learn it from anywhere. Mm. And that's uh, actually, I'll, I'll mention this as well, I suppose, as I'm kind of a new, a, a new member of the team at Arabic Unlocked is um, the Arabic script course at Arabic Unlocked is something I found so refreshing. Like the, the approach that, um, that our teacher in the Academy, Abdul Haq, took with teaching letters that English speakers will be familiar with first. That's something really unique. Like I actually hadn't seen that approach and is something which actually really lends itself well to a long-term future in Arabic wanting to speak as well, actually having students familiar with the sounds that they can make already in their own language. 
Um, so anyway, that's a little bit of rambling about the script generally, but, um, mm. but yeah, so I'd kind of been through that process myself of making myself a beginner again. And even being at Arabic Unlocked, I feel like a beginner in some senses, like getting used to our systems, getting used to how a team works and stuff like mm. that. Um, cause I've kind of been a lone ranger in, in my teaching of the Arabic language for a long time. So even quite recently, um, I've kind of been practicing being a beginner, but it's, it's something I think all Arabic teachers should do because when mm. you get, especially like a graduate level and you're, you're reading books in the Arabic language and stuff like that. It can be, it can be quite easy to lose yourself and lose track of what it's really like to learn a Jumla Ismiya for the first time. Mm. You, you can lose track of that quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose same thing applies as well when trying to teach children, because it can sometimes be quite frustrating. Like, why don't you get it? But what do we remember of being a six year old or a 10 year old? I mean, how many years have passed? I think even in psychology, there's a, there was a study done or something uh, along these lines, which basically proved that it's impossible to unknow something unless you like get amnesia or something you forget. But once you've once you've gained a perspective on something, it's impossible to then put yourself in the shoes of somebody who didn't know that thing. Mm. Um, it's like now, for example, I mean, an easy example is if if you didn't know somebody who stood behind you with a gun pointing at your head, you would be extremely relaxed. Like you would, you just unaware of it. And if then you became conscious of it, that somebody stood behind you with a gun, you'd never be able to be as calm as you were before when you Sorry. were unaware of it, just simply because now you know, even if you try, now you have to consciously try and ignore it, try and calm yourself down or whatever else. Um, Do, in, um, in your teaching of the Arabic language, with something like that in mind, like if you're teaching a concept that's quite simple, do you ever find yourself tempted to incorporate things that are maybe more advanced? Like, cause you have that knowledge, you have the knowledge mm. that, that there's someone stood behind this Jumla Ismiya with a gun or AKA, <laughs> there's something really interesting, like an example from the Quran where Allah uses it or something more advanced, maybe like uh, grammatically or whatever. Do you, do you find it difficult as a teacher to restrain yourself from un uh, unloading it? Yeah, I think a lot of this is, uh, depends on a person and their personality. And uh, I know when I was a student, I was always asking my teacher questions that were beyond the scope of what we were learning. And he'd always, he had a certain style where he'd just refuse to give you some before it's time. So he'd say, look, we'll get to that when we get to that. Focus on what I'm trying to teach you now. Uh, I was quite inquisitive in that sense. Some students, that has the opposite effect. If you tell them something beyond what they're already trying to learn and they're struggling with something now and you give them something more advanced, they become disheartened, like, oh, I can't even understand one plus one. And now you're talking about X plus Y. Like, well, how am I ever going to understand any of this? Uh, so it, it depends on the student. It depends on, yeah. obviously, as a teacher as well, I, I am tempted to yeah, drop a lot of these things, but then I have to rein it in depending on who the student is. Sometimes, I don't, yeah, like as you say, like the, the most important thing is really just being able to read the room most of the time. Like there are some formats and some students who can really take it, like they really want it. In fact, like, because I, I have a tendency in sort of my story walkthroughs and stuff in like Arabic story walkthroughs to have a tendency to take a word and go on a tangent with it. Sometimes it's me doing revision in my head. Sometimes it's me just remembering that I read something about that. And the feedback I've had from lots of the more advanced students is that they actually like the tangents more than the main thing mm. <laughs> a lot of the time. But that wouldn't be the case if it was somebody's bread and butter of their Arabic language learning. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like if there was someone on our like Quranic Arabic Unlocked course where they were using that as kind of the main backbone of their studies. Yeah. It probably wouldn't be appropriate necessarily in that case. But in a YouTube video or a podcast or something where, where we're reading... You know, I'm reading a story about Ala Uddin or whatever it is, or mm. Layla with Vitab or whatever. Mm. Like I remember in, when I did the Layla with Vitab series, the word, um, uh, the word uh, Musibah came mm. up, right? And for some reason, it just came to my head that the, the, there's a word in Urdu, Musibat. Mm. I think that means like a, mean like a calamity. It's or, pretty much the same as Arabic. Yes, yeah. the same word, yeah. right? For some reason, I brought it up. It's from the verb asaba in Arabic. And uh, afterwards I thought to myself, why would they need to know that? <laughs> yeah. Like if the, the vast majority of the students probably don't care. <laughs> yeah. But, but I get the feedback from lots of students that sometimes these tangents and little proofs that you have knowledge about things are quite interesting to people. Yeah, yeah. This is what I mean. So it depends on the student sure. and uh, yeah, it depends on what level they're at as well. And like I said, if, you, if you're struggling with one thing and then we're dropping other things, it's, it's a distraction. But mm. yeah, some people who've, who, who understand the first thing, they might be a bit more interested in these, these other tangents. Um, but you mentioned about, um, so I want to go back to your kind of story so we can carry on the timeline. Because um, you mentioned, and we'll, we'll go into this about you joining Arabic Unlocked. Um, but before that, between you starting to teach Arabic, um, so you began by teaching children locally, I think you mentioned um, tuition and that kind of thing. And then of course, before you joined Arabic Unlocked, you were doing your own thing online, uh, the Arabic with 60, 60 Steps program. Um, tell us a bit more about that experience in just teaching in general. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, so 
so I, I worked as a primary school teacher and for whatever reason that, that didn't really work out for me. I knew that I wanted to teach Arabic and I'd also kind of seen people starting YouTube channels and having huge impact using social media for, for educational purposes. I'd seen that happening. I'd seen someone create a video once and it'd be seen by people all over the world thousands of times. And I, I didn't know if I would be good at it. I just knew it was something that really needed to be tried. And to be honest, when I first stood in front of a camera and made videos, they were just awful. Like mm. it's quite, it's something that takes a little bit of time to get used to standing in front of a camera because at the end of the day, there's not a person there. At the end of the day, if you just say, I'll oh, forget it and walk out the room, no one will know. Yeah. But you, you, as you kind of have more students, it starts to mean more and you start to look down the lens and see the people you're helping. And so in this time, I start, sort of started creating YouTube videos. At that point, it was just Arabic with Sam. And I had my Somali language stuff as well um, that was going on on a different YouTube channel. And, and I was just going to children's houses and teaching the kids. Financially, it was awful. Like, it was whatever per hour, a couple of times a day or something like that. Like, mm. it, it, I guess it would replace a full-time job for, for some people. But it was, um, it was a real challenge financially to, to sort of make that work. But I... I kind of compare that to people who are chefs, for example. Most fantastic chefs who can run restaurants and be head chefs and can be the last line of defense to stop bad meals going out. They did their time on the line. Like they did their time as a line chef, mm. doing managing one station. They they served their time. And when I look back at my experience teaching those kids, I probably taught, I probably taught 100 children, probably. Mm. That really was me. That was me mastering my craft. That was me learning different ways and trying different ways to actually teach a, a jumla fi'liya. That was me trying different ways in the trenches to get good at actually delivering the Arabic language to often not even people who weren't brilliant at Arabic, but people, but people who didn't even want to be because they're children. Mm, <laughs> a lot yeah, of the time they've been yeah. forced into it anyway. So that those years were really my time in the trenches, I think. That, and, and we're still living living in London at this point. Maybe after my first son, Yusuf, was born. Um, we moved to Cornwall and um, the first course I actually designed was a mini course uh, called the best of stories, which was kind of a tribute to my boy Yusuf. Cause obviously, oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The best of stories is Ahsan al-Qasas. Um, yeah. That Allah narrates to us in the Quran. And that was like a very short online course. Good little tester for me really to kind of see if I could create content online that people would want. And that was a free course. That was a free little course. And it was kind of, it fit into the story. It was a nice story as well. I kind of created a course after my first little boy was born. Um, but when we moved to Cornwall, that brought all my teaching online. That was kind of the, the introduction to how powerful the internet can be for being more efficient as an organization, a one-person organization, but an organization nonetheless, because I'm still managing a website and creating content and managing everything, really. Um yeah, so that that was that was when everything went online. All those students that I had from London, we had to move all of that online when I moved back to Cornwall. So that that was the transition for me, going from doing lots in person to things being online. Um, the students stayed, which I was really surprised by. I thought I'd lose at least half of these kids, you know, to to go online. But so so that was kind of the time when I really needed to create more YouTube videos, get better at the kind of things I've got good at presenting in people's homes, sat across a table like this. I needed to kind of translate into an online environment and create more content on there. And um, and that was when that was when the Arabic in 60 Steps program kind of was first born. There was kind of a, like a soft launch of it with the first module of it initially, um, which really took students from sort of building their first sentences, knowing different tenses in the positive and the negative. So just knowing how to put like, me before a past tense verb, mm -hmm. just knowing how to put la in front of a present tense verb and using len with a three and solve in the future. Um, so it had just some things like that in, in the beginning in that first module. Um, and then after that, that was, we, we moved again, we moved to Northampton. Northampton, although it wasn't like close to my family or close to my wife's family, it, I had my own place and like Cornwall was not as expensive as London but Northampton's cheaper than both of them. So I was able to just for the first time in my career have space to actually have like a little studio at home, have a place where I recorded content, actually be able to focus on that. And that's when the Arabic in 60 Steps program really developed. You know, we reached hundreds of students in that time. We, we probably got over 500 active students at that time uh, who joined the program and the book improved massively as well. I have a video from a while ago um, kind of um, presenting the different books that we had. Because in the beginning, it was like an A3 sheet of sheets of paper 
or folded over and stapled. Okay. You've seen those sorts of books. Yeah, yeah. The, the books were like that in the beginning. We had four separate books for each module. And then we kind of had better designs and they became like spiral bound and stuff like that. And um, yeah, that all of that happened in Northampton. Yeah, and I think maybe when we moved back to London after that, the Arabic in 60 Steps program probably reached a thousand students maybe. And COVID happened. Um, and for our industry, like teaching language or teaching anything online or doing anything online, to be honest, teaching or not, um, COVID was an interesting time for us because um, we were probably maybe one of the industries that did well out of it. Um, and I gained lots more students and le learn a lot more even about how people in the West behave. Sometimes when we think about teaching or building our own things, we're really idealistic about how we wish our students were. Mm. Like we really tr maybe trust sometimes that our students will commit a certain way. And I think in that time, I learned a lot about how people really are. And unfortunately, people people's lives are really unpredictable and people's moods are really unpredictable as well so so things like make giving people lifetime access to the program things like making the program completely self-paced things like that came into the program in covid when we had a bit more intense focus and i was able to learn a lot more from students and how they really behave i suppose so um yeah so that's that's kind of what happened living in london we grew to over a thousand students and and then there was the move to Somalia. I don't know how much you want to get into that, if, if that's of interest to you at all. Yeah, it is. Um, let's let's circle back to that because I want to talk a lot more about Somalian. Uh, Som Somalian language is called Somalian, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. called Somali. Somali. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I just made up a word there. <laughs> um, but um, we'll come to that in a minute. Just wanted to touch on the point of um, of learning languages online. Now this kind of contradicts what we said earlier about being able to relate to the students because neither of us technically learn Arabic online in that environment. We do teach it online. Um, but our journey in learning Arabic was more offline uh, in, in some kind of institute. Um, trying to be as unbiased as possible. What's your take on online learn language learning, particularly for Arabic? Because a lot of students have reservations. In COVID, they didn't have a choice. Now that things have opened back up, people have reservations about the effectiveness of online learning. And they say, oh, I need to be in a class. Or what would you say to that? I would actually um, push back a little bit on it. I think, because actually, even though the main structure of it, like if you were to look at my life, you would be like, he was doing a degree. But I was consuming tons of online content for learning the Arabic language. Mm. Like even before I went to university and I was walking around my village doing my paper and listening to Surat al-Baqarah, I also came across podcasts that were teaching the Arabic language and their website with downloadable episodes and stuff like that. And I learned lots of Arabic from that. I learned lots of Arabic from these online resources. And I, I had a real privilege actually to be like 17 years old in sort of the uh, earlier stages, like we hadn't even seen some of these bigger languages, companies or apps come about at that point, to actually see people sat in a room like this, creating content about learning the Arabic language. And um, there was like Arabic Pod 101. I don't know if those brothers are still around or whatever, but mm. there was there were some resources like that that I really benefited from. And, um, and they obviously provided um, a flexibility that obviously just was not available in, um, in, uh, in my more structured sort of in-person studies, I think. And, you know, I think it wasn't even in the conversation. Like when I went to university, it wasn't in the conversation to have online programs that are as high quality as Quranic Arabic Unlocked. They just weren't. Like, like Quranic Arabic Unlocked teaches many of the things that I learned throughout my entire degree, right? It teaches lots of the things, particularly in the first year, some of the most fundamental things about the actual structure and nuts and bolts of Arabic. And we even kind of have a perception, maybe it's more common here in the UK where people are a little bit more traditional with online learning and stuff, but we have a perception that it's maybe lower value if it's not, if you're not, if you've not got the teacher in front of you. Mm. But when you move the focus towards actual like accessibility, or you move the focus towards flexibility, or you move the focus towards student experience, why on earth was I getting up in the morning in the cold winters of the UK and walking half an hour to my lecture hall and back to learn something that I could have learned in perhaps a more convenient manner. So mm. I don't know, like it is really common to see Arabic students or, or Arabic teachers, people who have become teachers talking about something that they think about Arabic, but then realizing they not they don't do that. Um, but I don't think there's actually anything wrong with that. I think from having completed it, looking back and thinking, well, really things could have been a lot more efficient. You know, one in particular for, from running my podcast is it's really common to have teachers kind of criticize a grammar heavy approach to learning Arabic, right? Like I've had lots of guests on my podcast um, criticize that and say like it should be a far more kind of speaking, but they all benefited from a grammar focused yeah. step by step, very kind of rigid approach. They all did 100% of them. Yeah. They all went through particular books and stuff like that. But 
but that, that doesn't mean that either of them is invalid. It, it means that they benefited from that, but they have a certain insight having come out the, the, the other side of it, I suppose. So, um, yeah, so I, I suppose to answer the question, I'd say for, on one hand, I would um, I, I'd push back on the idea that I didn't learn online because I learned loads online, mm. you know, but the, the actual core structure came from something that was in person. But that was because nothing else was really available then. Or if it was, I certainly wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Anything of the scale of the kind of programs that, that we offer, for example. So, um, yeah, I suppose that's what I'd say. Mm, interesting. I mean, my take on this would be, uh, first of all, yeah, what you said about resources and stuff like that is definitely very different now. Even pre-COVID, uh, the advancements in kind of online learning resources, the technology that you can deliver them through, things like Zoom. Zoom was never a thing um, just a few years ago. Uh, when, when, these, when these technologies didn't do the job required, then, then you could argue, yeah, look, face-to-face -face communication versus a video call, for example. Now there's almost no difference in, in the, the kind of instant communication you can have on a video call versus face-to-face. -face. So what I would say is about learning online, be it a language or anything else. I feel like people, when they, sometimes you say something, but if you dig deeper, there's a the deeper meaning behind it. There's that whole concept of seven whys. Um, ask yourself why seven times to get to the core root of what the actual issue is. Um, so you say, oh, I need to learn in a class. Okay, why? Oh, I, uh, I need to be able to, uh, you know, see the teacher. Why? And if you keep digging, you find there's a number of things that students actually want or need. But that's not what they're saying. They say, I need to be in a classroom. This, this even applies to something like remote work or working in, a, on, in an office. Like why would working in an office be better than working remote? Oh, well, we can't communicate as well. Okay, so then that's the actual issue, not being in the office. Mm. If we can communicate equally well, or if I could argue we could communicate better remotely, wouldn't it be better to work remotely? If, if, if you need to be in a class with a teacher because you need to see his face, then what's the difference between seeing his face physically or seeing it on a, on a, board, uh, on a screen? Sorry, um, In a university lecture hall, you, you can tell better than me. Uh, if you're sat at the back, can you barely see the teacher's face anyway? Um, a lot of the times they'll be using a PowerPoint presentation that you're looking at most of the time anyway. Um, so yeah, what is it that you that you actually want? A lot of the times it's things like yeah, the ability to to see the the teacher under get better communication from him, the ability to have a classroom environment because it provides you with support and motivation, other students to communicate with, and when you break it down to these ingredients, if you can then deliver them equally or better in an online environment, plus offer things that being in a physical classroom doesn't offer you, like flexibility. Yeah, like you said, a lot of the times again, university students now they'll you'll miss a lecture and they'll just watch a recording of it online um, because of the flexibility flexibility that it offers. Um, so yeah, th there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to be said on this topic, but I feel like there's a very strong argument for, for being able to learn better online than, than in a classroom environment. Of course, there's, that, that does take a lot of introspection and, and understanding yourself as a student. Some students are just better in time management, better in self-discipline. That is obviously a very important factor in learning online. If you've got really bad self-discipline, then yeah, sometimes you need somebody physically stood over your head to make sure you do the work. But then, then the issue is, I think you're going to struggle in every scenario then. <laughs> probably. You've probably got a bigger problem. Yeah. 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 If you need to address that first, then yeah. Then whether it's in a classroom or online, you've got... Something I like the idea of that we're kind of seeing a little bit more of is more of a blended approach to, to, to learning. Like yeah. I would quite like for, for, for us at Arabic and Logpath to be in a position where we can have a blended approach where we where we are mostly online. We use the internet for the things that the internet's good for. And we use some things in person that perhaps things in person are good for. Yeah, Like there can be local groups and stuff like that. It's something that we never got to at the 60 Steps program, but sometimes we'd have particular pockets of the world that would have concentrations of lots of our students. Um, particularly like in, in the US, there are some cities that just kind of have more Muslims or more people who are interested in learning Arabic. So to have like meetups or something like that in those places or physical resources in some cases that you send people. Like I, I like the idea of um, being able to use the best of both worlds in that case. Mm. And um, it'd be nice to explore some of those things in the future, inshallah. So on that point, actually, about uh, doing something blended, it's something, inshallah, we're going to be looking at. Uh, we don't know exactly how it will look in the future, but the there's definitely things which... Everything I said about online is true about offline. There are certain things that offline can do better. And we have to acknowledge that and, and understand that and lean into that, use that where necessary. And there are certain things which online can do better. But I think a lot of people misunderstand the things which are exclusive to both. And there's not a lot. Certain things both can do and both can do very well and both can do very badly. Some people think it's a silver bullet to, oh, just by being in a physical classroom, suddenly I'm going to have 
all this encouragement from the teacher and the class, not necessarily depends on the teacher, depends on the class. Sometimes you get more from an online classroom and then you can say the same about an online class, you might join and there's there's nothing coming in, in, in that regard from a teacher or, or from your other students and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it, it's some of that. I think everybody has to become more conscious of to understand themselves, to understand exactly what they're looking for, exactly what's on offer in a course, in a class, um, before they make that decision. Um, would you say the same thing applies to immersion in terms of learning, going to an Arab speaking country? Because again, a lot of people think oh, I need to go to Egypt or uh, you mentioned you were studying in Palestine for a year. Um, what's your take on that? That's interesting. I mean, it, immersion in that sense uh, has its role, but particularly for speaking. Whereas I think, as we were mentioning earlier, like m most people have more specific goals than that, I think. Like if, if a person really wants to access a significant amount of Quran, for example, I don't necessarily think they need to immerse themselves in Egypt for a year or something like that. So I, I think it depends on your goals, but that there are ways of achieving a level of immersion, perhaps even better in some contexts than actually being in an Arab country sometimes by using the internet. Like th this is an incredibly powerful tool that we have. Like a, I think most people who have a mobile phone in their pockets, they don't actually realize how powerful that machine is, that it can actually allow them to have Arabic in their ears so frequently, like the amount of content that's available mm. to help people learn the Arabic language and immerse themselves in it more so than perhaps going to another country. Because like, like you're saying, some people think that a particular strategy is just a silver bullet. Lots of people think, well, if I'm just physically in Al-Qahira, if I'm just in Cairo for six months, I'll learn Arabic. But that's really not true. Like even in, when I was studying in Cairo, when I was in Palestine as well, I saw lots of people go there for an amount of time and not learn much Arabic. Like it's absolutely possible to do that. It's, it's mm. more consciously about how you as a student are really conscious about how you carve out that Arabic language learning journey for yourself. Because yeah, that, that that is something I've seen many times. I've seen many times people go to another country and and particularly like the kinds of courses that we have online, we're able to guide people through broadening their vocabulary if that's a particular goal of theirs or helping them access particular things depending on their goals. That's something that's actually often um, more available online, I think, in some cases. Because if you go to an Arabic speaking country, this was my experience when I went to Palestine. I got really fluent for the first few months telling people about my journey to Islam. Because that's what everyone wanted to know. I had the exact same conversation like 500 times. It's what everybody wanted to know. That the same questions, how did you become a Muslim? What did your parents think about it? All that stuff, right? But like I really hadn't had a conversation about how much does that fish weigh? And can I buy a kilo of this mm. in the market and stuff like that? Or I hadn't had conversations about things I was learning in my lectures at university. I was listening in the lecture and I was saying, shukran jazilan ma salam at the end of the lesson. And I'll go out and may never use it again, maybe. Mm. So if students do really want to take this approach of going to an Arabic speaking country, there's another level up from just being there anyway. And, and it's not an easy one, like to really manufacture you having those conversations can actually be harder with the the intensity of actually having someone in front of you trying to speak that language to you. So I, I wouldn't ever discourage people. Like if people mm. want to go and dedicate themselves to that kind of journey, they they want to be in Alexandria for a year or something. I, I never, ever discourage people from that. But more people than should think it's a silver bullet that just by being in that country, whereas, you know, whereas something online that's actually well considered and well thought out might actually be able to provide you more guided immersion than than you actually get just by sort of sitting in Egypt for a year. Mm. So um, it kind of, we, I find that we keep on coming back to the same idea of students really need to kind of take it upon themselves to know what kind of a learner they are and, and select the resources that manufacture the right experience for them, I suppose. Mm. We keep on kind of coming back to that, don't we? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of parallels between classroom and online and Egypt or any Arab speaking country versus your own house, for example, because it all comes down to what exactly you're trying to get out of it. Like if you're going to these countries to be immersed in the language, okay, what does that mean? It means hearing the language more and speaking it more. Okay, are they impossible to do outside of them countries? And like you said, you can probably hear more of the language correctly used um, and have the flexibility of slowing it down, replaying it, um, searching what it means and all that kind of stuff using the internet, using technology versus being in an Arabic speaking country. And then in terms of using the language, yeah, like I said, if that's in alignment with your goals, then fair enough. Also, again, the internet offers plenty of ways to do that. That sometimes you actually find, subhanAllah, by going to these places, you're 
in your head, it's very rosy posy. I'm going to go there and study Arabic all day long. No, you're, you're spending time cooking and traveling and washing your clothes and, and living. And how much time you actually spend and you're in an environment that you're not used to compared to being at home in the comfort of familiar surroundings. So how much time and effort you actually spend studying versus you spend doing all these other things and you're trying to cram in study, <clears throat> trying to cram in study where you can. Um, yeah, it all comes down to students just becoming very conscious of these things, aware of them, and then mm. having honest conversations with themselves. I've certainly spotted patterns of who successful students are. You know, obviously I've mentioned, like I've, I've had about a thousand students, not all of them have completed the program yet, but maybe of the 100, 150 graduates we have, the common theme isn't that they went to Egypt rather than uh, Jordan. That that's not the common theme, or the mm. common theme isn't that they learn offline rather than online, or that like th those aren't the common themes that are in them. Like the common themes are that they have a really strong why for why they're learning the Arabic language and they've made it part of their identity. They they when they join a program or when they decide they want to learn Arabic, they're not saying I want to learn Arabic. I want to learn Arabic in a year. That that's not the kind of language they use. That they are an Arabic student now. They are a person who knows Arabic now. That's kind of how they talk about themselves. It's almost like it's part of their identity that, that they are a person who is committed to learning Arabic. But yeah, so that, that's kind of interesting. Like with, with the successful, all the successful students, that's what kind of unites them rather than one particular place, I suppose. Mm -hmm. have, have you found something similar with, with successful students in Arabic Unlocked? Have you seen any kind of um, consistent and um, yeah, just consistent themes throughout the successful students? Yeah, and I think that's definitely one of them. I think uh, being on the fence and, and saying I'm, I'm trying to learn Arabic versus I'm going to learn Arabic, whether it takes me 10 years or it takes me a year or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, it's a massive it's a massive factor, especially expectations as well. People who go in expecting it to be a certain way rather than I'm here for the ride and it'll, I'll do it. Hopefully I'll do it quickly, but it'll take as long as it needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think it, to be honest, if I was going to, the common theme, if I was going to boil it all down to one thing, it's all mindset. Like mindset is the thing that will stop a person from studying Arabic, make them give up, make them not start in the first place. Um, or it's the thing that will make them persevere and, and carry on till they finally see progress and till they reach whatever the goal is. Mm. Um, so yeah, moving from, so moving on from here, I just want to carry on with your, your story a little bit. So we've, um, we've covered up until your whole Arabic learning journey, Arabic teaching journey. Uh, now we're at present day where alhamdulillah, you've, you've joined the Arabic Unlock team. What was it that led you to leave behind what you were doing with the Arabic in 60 Steps program and kind of being a one-man team to kind of joining us and uh, trying, to, trying to move forward with what we're trying to do here together? What was it that you saw that, that kind of led you to make that decision? So in terms of the, the mission and the why, it really doesn't change. It's really, we help get Arabic into brains. That's really, the, 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 the mission has really remained the same, actually, to be honest. And I think even since um, you, you were a guest on my podcast, when we kind of started having these conversations, it really was clear to me that we were aligned in lots of ways, that, that we really cared about students. We cared about leveraging um, good strategies, actually, for helping students all, all over the world, but m m many of whom are from the West or, or English speakers. Um, but... I kind of always saw myself as a person who would be stronger with a more specific role in a team. This, this kind of role of being a one person band, like we, we see lots of people like this now who are YouTubers who run a channel by themselves or people who have like a side hustle by themselves. That's really not for everybody. And I think it actually has some limitations in, in its capacity, even for the people who are the best at it. So like, for example, even some of the people who are the most successful, like if you look at some of these personalities in the business space and stuff like or in the political space, like people who host shows or people like Tim Ferriss and stuff like that over in books who kind of on the face of it look like, like they are Tim Ferriss. They have people behind them, mm -hmm. like they've got a team, like maybe even bigger than ours, Arabic Unlocked, even though they appear and present as sort of one person. So for me, like I, I really think it's, I'm in a more comfortable position being part of a team with bigger objectives where I can do something very specific that I'm, that I'm good at. And we can have other people on our team who are doing more specific things that they're good at. I've, I see actually serving the students more effectively in, in that manner. And actually it was um, one, one of our team members, Lisa, wasn't it, who does our marketing. Um, she mentioned this proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm. And although I, I, I'm sure I'd heard that before, that really kind of that really kind of um, uh, summarizes the feelings that I have towards joining Arabic Unlocked, and because the the goal is bigger now, like 
in the past, it was always sort of how do I kind of take care of myself and my family whilst also doing something I'm really passionate about. But in moving into this role, where I have a kind of a more defined role in our academy and stuff here, the focus has sort of moved away from that and has been how do we how do we serve the goal for the students rather than rather than about myself. And I think that's just generally a really positive move for myself and for the students. So mm. that's kind of the mindset, I think, going from doing my own kind of thing into being part of a sort of something big with bigger visions. Mm. On, the, I like how you said the, the mission is to get Arabic into brains. Uh, maybe rewording that or, or revisiting that. What, what are we doing here? Like what are, we, what are we trying to accomplish? Like somebody who, I think somebody who gets it, gets it. Like it doesn't need explaining. But somebody who doesn't understand like why Arabic? What's the big deal? What? Is it really that important? How would you explain it to them? I think we're, I certainly know for yourself, but I think generally as a team, we're people who have seen how Arabic language can make our lives better, can improve our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can make us people who are more likely to cry during Taraweeh. And that's something, that's something that's really worth fighting for and working for. You know, and I don't know, the, the, the people who, who don't see that and have never seen that, these people are really miskeen, wallahi. Like they're they're people who, um, not not in any. I don't say miskeen in any kind of condescending manner. Mm -hmm. so I say miskeen in that it's unfortunate, yeah. perhaps, that just in their lives they haven't seen how going from understanding, um, um, just something something from the Quran, being stood in the salah and understanding something from from the Quran, they haven't seen a difference between that and being a person who's just hearing sounds in the salah. So, you know, so so as far as I'm concerned, that's why we're here. We're here to give that experience to, to Muslims all over the world, people who weren't born into Arabic speaking families, or even in some cases, people who were born into Arabic speaking families, who maybe actually didn't appreciate the sweetness of the Quran that was sent down in their language. You know, even, even it's quite often in cases like that, sometimes people are brought up in Arabic speaking families and they think, well, I know Arabic. So mm -hmm. I just am a person of the Quran because, because I know Arabic, but often through actually understanding more of the nuance of their language, actually end up tasting more of a sweetness of the Quran, and and that that's something that I'm here to share. That's something that I I think is is for the Muslims. So through Arabic Unlocked, we are people who actually can grant people a sweeter taste of the Quran. That's why we're here. I, I don't know if there is a greater why than that in the modern world, really. Mm, I think we were having a conversation before, weren't we? About and by the way, this is a a tip for anybody watching who uses a trackpad on a on a laptop. Um, the difference between using a trackpad on a laptop versus using an ergonomic mouse is like light and day. But there's certain things in life you have to just experience to understand what you've been missing out on. And um, yeah, anybody who uses a trackpad, try out a mouse and uh, you'll see the difference. But it's the same It's the same with what you were talking about in terms of experience of Quran in the Arabic language. I could talk about it all day. I could try and explain it in many different ways, but it's something that until you've experienced, you'll never truly appreciate what you were missing out on your entire life. Um, this is actually how I'd argue the Quran was meant to be interacted with. This is why the Quraysh, many of them just heard the Quran and accept, accepted Islam. Many of the Sahaba simply just heard it because they directly experienced it first. We have to unfortunately put a lot of effort in to reach that level of, not even to the level of them because we'll never have the Arabic proficiency that they had, but of being able to experience the Quran directly in Arabic and feel its power and understand some of what's being said and the eloquence of what's being said. Um, yeah, that's the that's the whole experience of the Quran. It's the difference between reciting the Quran or hearing the Quran reciting and and experiencing it, like I like to, how I like to describe it. Um, and like I said, the Sahaba, the, the Quraysh, they would experience the Quran directly, um, a little bit like yourself in terms of experiencing an aspect of it before becoming Muslim, and that kind of led you to Islam. Uh, this is what would happen to so many of the Sahaba. They would experience it, not just the the melody, but also the the depth in the meaning and the rhetoric and the balagha and all that kind of stuff without needing classes and years of studying like we do. Um, but yeah, this is something that we want to, I think now we've joined forces in that sense. Uh, yeah, Part of the mission is to help more Muslims get to a level where they can experience that. And it's, it's a lot more accessible than a lot of people realize. Um, we talk a lot about learning the most commonly used word in the Quran. That's a big step you can take to, to very quickly being able to experience. One, there's levels, of course, there's levels to it. But to go from not understanding anything to recognizing key words in, in, in whatever you're hearing recited to then understanding the entire ayah to then the whole surah to then um, understand the depth of the structure of the sentences and that kind of thing. You know, something something else I'd say about um, just just touching on me joining Arabic Unlocked as well is 
perhaps just in the nature that it's a team or perhaps the different kinds of brains that we have here at Arabic Unlocked. We obviously have the people from kind of different backgrounds, people in different specialisms. I saw an ambition, which we really need. Like typically people who go into the space of teaching the Arabic language, they tend to be people um, for whom and like humility is important to them. They don't tend to be the people who will come forward and say, the Muslims have a problem of not acce- accessing our scripture directly. We have a drought of Iman among the Ummah because we, we're not people who have stood in the Salah understanding the Quran. And to be an organization, I, I saw Arabic unlocked as an organization that has the capacity to step forward and say, we will solve this problem or we will at least make a solution accessible for this problem. Like the, the, the results of it obviously are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we can't say like we'll definitely sort of make these changes right. But to say that we are the people who will put ourselves in the best position to do that. I think generally in, in the space of education, but, but perhaps more so in Islamic education, Arabic, generally the people who go into it, as I say, aren't the kinds of people who are, who are organized enough to set up a, an efficient organization with ambitious goals and stuff like that. And I think Arabic Unlocked is a place where, where that kind of mission um, has the, the, there are the skills and the, and the drive and stuff within our organization to be that kind of force. And I, I really saw that um, for, for, from our conversation and stuff as well, and saw that something really attractive. So um, yeah, so I was going to say that, but but to kind of lead on to something else that you were saying, do you remember maybe the first time you understood an ayah of the Quran? Yes, very very vividly. Uh, mm, what was it? Uh, I speak about this in a few places. Um, it was when I was in. Uh, so we went to perform Umrah when I was maybe thirteen or twelve. Um, and up until that point, I I think I had been praying five times a day, maybe it was like a late Fajr now and again, but I was praying, but it was a very empty salah. It was very, I didn't even understand the concept of learning Arabic or understanding the Quran. It just never crossed my mind. It was never taught to us in that way. How old were you at this point? Sorry. 12, okay, 13. Right. Got it. And um, went to perform Umrah and we were praying Taraweeh. And I think it was probably the first night, if not, yeah, probably the first night because they read a juz and... Uh, I was stood on the roof of the Haram and from my from my angle I could directly see the Kaaba and I was praying uh, between me and the Kaaba was the uh, Maqam Ibrahim so I remember being praying that night it was quite hot I was probably just daydreaming and whatnot and um, I remember earlier in the Salah the guy next to me started crying I was like I probably didn't look at him but in my head I was thinking well, what was he crying about um, he was he was an Arab because I tried to speak to him afterwards and he didn't know any English um, so that, that got me thinking, first of all, what's he, what's he crying about? And then I remember the Imam recited, uh, When I heard the words Maqami Ibrahim, it kind of just snapped me out of whatever daydream I was in. And I thought, oh, he's talking about that thing in front of me, Maqami Ibrahim. And um, You knew it was called that. Yeah, because when we, when we just performed Umrah, of course, we, we were told that you need to do Tawaf. And then after Tawaf, you pray two raka'ah behind Maqami Ibrahim. Uh, so I remember being told that. I remember knowing, okay, that thing's Maqam Ibrahim. I need to go behind it. Or if I can't go behind it, pray anywhere in the masjid. Um, so yeah, I, I knew what it was and I knew what them two words meant. Just them two words. But SubhanAllah, I just, it, it kind of snapped me out of the, the ghafla or the daydream that I was in. Uh, and then just, I remember the rest of that tarawih thinking to myself, wow, if, imagine I understood the rest of what he's saying. Like, how would I feel? And that, that was definitely the, the turning point for me. Like, okay, I need to learn this language so I can understand the rest of what's being recited. Do you remember the first time that you understood an ayah of the Quran? So I remember one that's really vivid in my mind. There's one that had like a real emotional impact on me. And I, I don't know if it was the first, I want to put it in the timeline of my journey learning the Arabic language. It's when I was on my year abroad. And I know I started to access more of the Quran, like it may be my first year of my degree, but it had maybe been... I'd maybe understood like bits of, of the Quran and stuff here and there. I hadn't put together like a really profound um, sort of the ayah that I actually stood in the salah listening to. But I remember being in Palestine. And I remember praying Maghrib salah in, in the masjid that was closest to my house. And there's an ayah which I believe is in Surah Al-Hadid where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي يُنَزِّلُ عَلَىٰ عَبَدِهِ آيَاتٍ بَيِّنَاتٍ لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ So, yeah, who are the Yunazilu? It is the one who sent down ayat in Bayinat in clear ayat. Um Li Yukri Jakumana Bulumati Lan Nur to 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 take you out of out of the darkness into the light. And there was so much kind of going on in my head. Like number one, I was kind of pondering upon how Allah had brought me out of a place like Cornwall, which is which isn't it's just not a place where you expect people to become Muslims. 
like Allah had reached into Cornwall and chosen someone miskeen like me and chosen Islam for me and had, had gifted me Islam. So, so it had kind of brought me out, not like out of an unexpected place and into a place like Palestine, which, which obviously has Al-Quds there, there's Masjid Al-Aqsa there. Um, but then also I could only access that because Allah gave me the ability to learn the Arabic language. So there were so many things that kind of about that air that I just thought that was so beautiful. It was like, I'm really meant to be here because mm -hmm. there have been some times when I've been stood in the masjid and I've looked around me and thought, was I supposed to be here? Like, of course, like it's, it's Allah who has, who has decided this, right? <laughs> like it's on Allah's qadr that this is the case. But sometimes I look around in the masjid, not, not in a negative way and just think, subhanAllah, this journey that Allah has brought me on, like when my mother gave birth to me and she held me in her arms, she can't have imagined that this would be the way things would turn out. Mm, <laughs> you know, yeah. She can't have imagined that this, this boy born in Northampton General Hospital to two, you know, white English parents would possibly embrace Islam and then end up studying in Palestine and, you know, doing, going and being involved in the Dao in Uganda for a little while and studying in Egypt and, you know, now living in Mogadishu and stuff. But um, but when you ha when we have moments like that, and it really felt like the moment you you mentioned, um, obviously being being in the haram, the kind of moments when Allah just shows you that you're where you're meant to be, mm. yeah. So so even though I'm not sure if it's the first ayah, it's definitely kind of the earliest, most powerful example that I can kind of um, recall right now. Yeah, yeah. And since then, how often would you say you've had such experiences of hearing an ayah and feeling like you're being affected by it? Oh, very regularly. Maybe, mm. maybe most salah that are allowed. Like this, I feel like this. That are out loud, you mean? Yeah, as in like, <laughs> that, that are out loud. Yeah, yeah. yeah Maghrib or Isha yeah. or, or Fajr, yeah. M most, uh, most that are, are like that. Yeah, sometimes when I hear someone else recite it, it just, you can you can see it in a different way, I suppose. Like when, when I'm reciting the Quran, maybe part of my mind is thinking about making sure I'm I'm reciting correctly. And stuff like that, particularly if I'm leading, I'm mm. um, in Jamar or something, I'm thinking about reciting correctly and what ayah comes next and stuff like that. But when when I have the privilege of hearing someone else lead the salah and recite the Quran in the salah, um, yeah, I'd say almost almost every salah, I'll you know, I'll, I'll appreciate something from a particular ayah. You know, one one recently when I was back in Somalia, I was praying praying Fajr, and the Imam recited um, from Surah Al Ma'arij, "Innahum yarawnahu ba'idan wa narahu qariba." That, that they see it as something far away, as in talking about the, the Day of Judgment, right? That Allah, Allah's reckoning. Um, we see it as something far away, you know, in, in terms of our behavior, when you when you see us Muslims walking around, it's as if it's as if we're blissfully unaware that 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 the hour could be sooner than we think. You know, it's as if even, even for those of us who consciously on our tongues, the way we utter, we talk as if the day of judgment is soon, and uh, you know, we remind ourselves of what the signs of the hour coming and stuff like that in our dudus and things like that. But really, like as far as Allah is concerned, it is qareeb. Mm. It, it, it is something that is close. And, you know, even, even like the language in that, like even if someone was to get get our ebook, right? Unlock, like the unlocking the words of the Quran ebook, like all those words would be in that ebook, right? Like most likely. Yeah, most, yeah. If Pro not all of them. Probably, yeah. Yeah, if yeah, not probably, all of them, probably all right? Or in like, just in a little ebook of like 300 words, mm. like they would all be in there and you could start appreciating the nuances of how Allah talks about everything in, in his whole book. So, um, yeah, so it's very regular, you know, but it's not, it's not like you enter the matrix, all of a sudden you know Arabic. Yeah. Like often when people think about, I want to learn Arabic to understand the Quran. And even me, when I first moved to London and I made friends who were Arabs, I had this idea in my head that Arabs heard a different Quran to me. I had this idea that when Arabs, when they heard the Quran, they like entered the matrix. So they, they did their, their takbir mm. and it was like zoom and they just heard like a different thing to us. It's not like that. It's it's much more gradual than that. And, but there's kind of something beautiful about having worked for it as well. Like even how in the Arabic language, there's a there's a difference between like, um, between like falaha and najaha. Like these verbs are, are different things or aflaha and najaha. They're, these are different things in Arabic. Like najaha is just success generally, but um, but the people who aflaha and the muflihun, they're people who have achieved success through efforts. Mm. You know, there's something sweet about tasting having achieved something through your efforts as well. And that's something that, that, that everybody gets to experience, but perhaps actually non-Arabs are favored in that manner in a sense. That, that the Quran that we get to taste the sweetness of in our salah, we've earned that. Mm. We've earned every harf of that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So not, not that najah is only without work. At the university I went to in Palestine, it's called Jamiatul Najah. 
and that was work. We had to do a lot of dirasa at that place. Mm, mm, <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah maybe, maybe it shouldn't have been called najah, but, so, <laughs> but no, najah can be any kind of success. I'm not saying that's only success that's given to you. But um, I, I think there's something worth mentioning, though, for us that the Arabic language actually distinguishes between the kind of success that's come with efforts, like the muflihun, other people who, who have achieved najah, but with a lot of a'mal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, to that point, it is important to stress that even at the time of the Prophet, there were people who had a much better grasp of the Arabic language than we ever will, than the greatest scholars of today's world ever will have. Uh, and they didn't accept Islam. Uh, the Quran probably had a negative effect on them in the sense that it, they were misguided uh, after hearing the Quran. It was driving them away. The Quran even says in it, it says, Some people will hear this book and be guided by it, and some people will hear it and be will as a result of that lead themselves astray mm. um so yeah it is an important we don't want to set expectations in the wrong place that somebody's just going to learn arabic and suddenly like you said sometimes you think that oh you know people in arabic must just be in this other world when they hear the quran but no it's not the case but you absolutely have the tools to be able to do what's required of you to get to that state which is tadabbur which is focusing the quran even says the reason it was revealed to was for tadabbur li yadabburu ayati so um and you cannot do that without the Arabic language. You cannot ponder over, if you don't even know what it means, what you're going to be pondering over. Um, so yeah, we're all about for, you know, emphasizing that these are tools and these are tools that you can use for different purposes. You cannot use them at all. It's up to you, but I want everybody to be equipped with them tools and have them uh, on hand to be able to use, inshallah. Um, now moving on from Arabic, which might sound weird because you see Arabic on the podcast. <laughs> But uh, you've mentioned Somalia a few times, and I'm sure people who don't know your story about Somalia or why we're talking about Somalia or Somali, the Somali language, um, are probably wondering. Uh, so let's delve a little bit more into that. So um, do you speak Somali? Uh, why do you speak Somali? How do you speak Somali? Let's, let's talk about these things. Yeah, so first, the, um, yeah, you're, you're right that it is Somali. Um, in the Somali language, they say Somali. They stretch the R and the R a little bit, Somali. Um, although Somalian might mean someone like what I might be at some point, somebody who has acquired Somali citizenship, but they're not ethnic Somali. Okay. But, um, but but those people, but there aren't many, if any, of those people at the moment. Um, the, the the people who have Somali citizenship are are so Somalis and Somalians would be the same thing. But but when there start to be people, maybe like myself, who acquire Somali citizenship, but are not Somalis, maybe Somalian is the term for them. I don't okay. know. But um, so do I speak Somali? If it were to be yes or no, I suppose the answer would be yes, because like I, I live in Mogadishu and I, I have to use Somali. The, the level of the average level of English in Mogadishu is not a high. And also you'd bring attention to yourself that you perhaps wouldn't want by choosing to speak English. Like when, I, when I'm in Mogadishu, people think I'm Syrian. There's lots of Syrians who live in Mogadishu. And um, it's not entirely not about Arabic, I think, because uh, Arabic is used lots in Mogadishu, in, in Somalia. I'd even say the level of Arabic spoken by an average Somali is enough for an Arab to go and travel to Mogadishu and like live and work there and stuff. Um, like lots of the, the builders and stuff are building the houses around where I live. Lots of them are Yemenis and they, most of them don't learn Somali. They just can get by like enough of the, like the tuk-tuk drivers and the taxi drivers, people working in restaurants, they know enough Arabic to like have a bit of back and forth in Arabic with them and stuff. Mm. So people always come up to me when I go to the beach. I go, I go to the beach after Fajr most mornings. And people always come over to me and they think I'm from Syria. And they like come over to me and they try out a little kayf al-hal. They try out a, uh, you know, ayna teskun or they try out a few things on me. Mm. And uh, I keep up appearances and let them think it. I don't go stopping them and say, no good, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually from London, don't you know? <laughs> I, I don't do that. I, I let them think it. Because it's more like, it's, I don't know, it's something people are more familiar with there as well. Like, There are Europe, people from Europe who live and work in Mogadishu, but they all live in one particular area. And there's an area around the airport called Halane. Um, but I don't live anywhere near Halane. Like, I, I, I live in an area that's really for locals mm. and stuff. Yeah. So if I was to walk around, you know, and, and people probably wouldn't believe me even. Like, even on my way to the airport and, like, at checkpoints and stuff, they check my passport. They don't believe that I'm originally... English, they don't even believe me. Mm. Like if imagine if you see me, me walking down to the beach in a Marawis, they call it Marawis. And I think in Yemen they call it a falta. Um our Bengali brothers, they call it a lungi. Like yeah. one, of, one of those things, right? Call it a toti. So right, okay, yeah, yeah. So like I wear one of those every day in Somalia. Like me walking down to the beach wearing a Marawis in the more after Fajr. That people don't look at a person like that and think that's what a British person looks like. 
Mm. Like, so they, they wouldn't even really believe me, I don't think. So. Yeah, what I've just found quite ironic is how you said at the beginning how you were shocked to see the white looking New Zealand person speaking Chinese. Imagine how somebody feels seeing the white SubhanAllah, Sam come, speaking Somali. Yeah, yeah, we've, <laughs> full come, circle. we've, we've come, yeah, yeah, we've mm. come full circle, SubhanAllah. Yeah. Yeah, subhanAllah. Maybe maybe at that point it was kind of something I wanted to achieve in my life. I was, I was really inspired by seeing people who not, not only were like smart enough to learn a new language, but people who were just open-minded enough and saw humans as other humans and wanted to learn a language of people who looked completely different to them. Like I, I thought that was just something really kind of beautiful and human. And I, I, th- I, think, I think I did kind of um, subconsciously make that a goal of mine as well. Like, yeah. I love it. When I'm, when I'm in the Bajaj or whatever, and I'm chatting to the Bajaj. We call them a Bajaj. It's a tuk-tuk. I think mm. knows what tuk-tuk. Mm. We call them Bajaj. Maybe it's a brand name or something. Oh, rickshaw, I think. Uh, is yeah, the word. right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I'm in there, um, I do the money. I say, like, Lamborghini, you see, for a Hamahawai, and they tell me their phone number. I put the phone number in right and stuff. I say, like, have you received the money? There's some, um, yeah, moments like that are, are a real joy for me. Yeah, subhanAllah. So, the, so why, why Somali? Why did you learn Somali? So, I went to Uganda in the summer of, I think, 2013. An opportunity came up from a masjid near, near me in Cornwall. There was someone from Uganda who wanted people for da'wah, basically. People who had some knowledge of Christianity um, and people could people who were educated and stuff and could present well and stuff. Mm. So I had this opportunity to go there yeah, in the summer of 2013. I went to so many beautiful places in Uganda. Like, that was the first time I'd been to like a sub-Saharan African country. And uh, lots of the uh, Imma speak Arabic there as well. Mm. Like I remember thinking at the time, how good would how good content would it be if I was like recording me chatting in Arabic to like a Ugandan imam in this little masjid or whatever. But um, I didn't have the skills or the confidence for it at the time. But So I was in Uganda and I met loads of Somalis in Uganda, um, particularly in the eastern cities we visited like Tororo and Busia. Um, yeah, there's a city called Tororo as well. And I'm from a city in Cornwall called Tororo. Oh, right. SubhanAllah, <laughs> it, was like a, it was like a coming round of the journey where I came to another Tororo, but in another part of the world. Yeah, so in those cities, there's lots of Somalis. Um, in those villages and cities and they're really in uganda yes in uganda yeah and they're very active in the dawah as well they're um yeah the people involved in the dawah and and they were really good hosts and stuff as well like there was lots of us traveling from kampala which is the capital city in uganda mm-hmm. over to that part of the country for dawah and um it was almost all somalis hosting us in their houses because it was in ramadan as well mm-hmm. so it was yeah almost all somalis hosting us and um yeah and they taught me some some of their language and they taught me how to say good morning which is subah on exim and like I thought, sabah. I've heard sabah before, and like I, I end up just picking up bits of their pronunciation and stuff. They have an ayn in their language as well. They have the a sound. Um, yeah, they have a ha sound as well. They, they spell it. They don't use the Arabic script though in Somali. Mm. They um, use the letter c for an ayn. Mm. Um, so like for example, the the name Omar in Somali, they spell the name Omar C U M A R Omar. Okay. Yeah. Or um, when I was a primary school teacher, there was a Somali girl, little girl. Um, at the school and her name was Nimra but everyone called her Nimco like all oh, of the okay. teachers were calling her Nimco <laughs> sounds like a company of some sort yeah Nimco it does doesn't yeah. it yeah so she just she just accepted it after after a while she's like yeah, just call me Nimco yeah. <laughs> but her name is Nimra yeah so and they use an X for a ha so the name Muhammad they spell it with an X rather than an H in the middle uh, Muhammad yeah how do, how do you write that M M A X A M I D Muhammad Mm. Yeah, or Muhammad. I think they use A's all, all, all mm. the way across it. But something on an Arabic language note that, that I've noticed that's really interesting, both in Uganda and in Somalia, is because they're not not Arabic speakers in terms of their their language on a day to day basis. They learn they learn Arabic grammar. They learn the Arabic language for purely for like scripture, right? Mm. So they'll really pronounce all of the harakat to the point that they'll even like, for example, like if you've ever met someone called Abdullah. From Somalia, they'll call him Abdullahi. Yeah. They pronounce the whole idafa. Yeah. And they even do this for the names of the Salah times. Salatul Fajri, yeah. Salatul Maghribi, Salatul Ishai. Like they do yeah. it with, with all of them. Yeah. They really love their idafas and pronounce all of their harakats, which is something that the Arabs don't even do. They, yeah, they favor yeah. waqf at the end of the <laughs> at the end of the sentences and stuff. Yeah. But um yeah, so so that's kind of how I ended up starting to learn Somali. When I came back to the UK, it was in my final year. I'd already written a dissertation in Arabic when I was in Palestine. Um, yeah, I did a dissertation on the description of the Christians in Rihla ibn Jubair. Because um, his Rihla is all about the Crusades and Salahuddin al-Ayubi and all that kind of stuff that's going on at that point in the Middle East. But um, so I'd already done a dissertation. So my academic supervisor was like, well, you've done the hard bit this year and you've got an open module. Why don't you just learn one of these African languages that we do here? Because you'll probably never have an opportunity again to have like 
the world leading lecturers who have written books on Ibo and Hausa and Zulu and Swahili and whatever other African lang languages, right? Amaziri or whatever, mm. right? And um, and Somali was one of the ones that he mentioned. And um, and I just thought that was an amazing opportunity um, to actually get kind of formal education in in Somali. So it was way before I met my wife. It was way before any of that, the, the interest in the Somali language and studying Somali. So that was actually part of my final year studies. I'm assuming your wife's from Somalia as well. Yeah, so she's, um, yeah, I forgot to mention that bit. Yeah, so she's, although I met her after, yeah, she's originally from Mogadishu, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I suppose, yeah. It's not a necessary requirement, but it, it fits with the story. Mm. Um, so I, when you're learning Somali, compare that to your journey in learning Arabic. Because when you're learning Arabic, this is your first time you're learning a new language, is it not? When you're learning Somali, you're now bilingual, Sam, who speaks English and Arabic. And you've been through the process of learning a language. So how did that translate to your journey in learning Somali? Yes, yeah, so it definitely helped me having had the experience of learning another language before. Like the, the ideas of learning vocabulary, learning grammar, actually having to push your comfort zone and speak another language, those things weren't completely alien to me when learning Somali. And I, I think it did help as well having Arabic just for more vocabulary. Like Somali has a lot of Arabic vocabulary. Whether, like in some cases, Arabic may have actually got vocabulary from Somali. In some cases, it may have been. A lot of the time, people kind of assume that it must have always been in one direction, all of the influence. But because Islam came in that direction, a lot of the time, people assume everything to do with the language did. But that's not necessarily the case. There's, in fact, there's lo lots of linguists who actually believe that Somali is an older language than Arabic, which is which is really interesting. Um, so, yeah, that, that helped massively. And even now, particularly living in, in Mogadishu, I, I think the dialect of Somali and Mogadishu lends itself to using Arabic vocabulary quite often as well. So sometimes if I don't know a word, I'll sneak, sneak the Arabic word in there <laughs> because mm. people will probably understand me and there's a chance it might be right. Like I'll probably make like a little sound change. But there's some sounds that, that don't exist in Somali that exist in Arabic, like bad, for example. Um, yeah, and ba, like any of those kind of full mouth letters don't exist. So sometimes um, you'll just kind of need to change them. Like, like for example, um, Somalis don't tend to pronounce the letter T so strongly. So, for example, like the word soler, they might say salad, salad. Mm. You sometimes hear, I, I don't know if you have Somali, do you have Somali restaurants here in Leeds? Not restaurants, but we have massages. Sure, sure. Well, like in, in the restaurants in, in London and other places, when it's time for salah, the Somalis will clap their hands and go salad, salad, salad. That's something you'll, you'll always hear. Right? In the restaurant? Yeah, in the restaurant. If it's time it sounds for like the salad. Sounds like they're serving salad. <laughs> yeah, it sounds just like salad. Yeah, they yeah. say salad. Um, and instead of like, Layla Tul Qadr. They say like Layla Dul Qatar. They end up like swapping <laughs> the D's and the T's. Mm. Salad Layla Dul Qatar. Yeah. So that, that's kind of like a speaking habit. So when you when you want to speak Somali and you're borrowing words from Arabic, it's good to just be aware of some mm. of those little things. I think it has a it has an official word, doesn't it? Uh, cognates, I think they call it. Right, okay. Where you have a word which is very similar or the same in another language which has the same meaning. Mm. Um and obviously languages which share um which stem from the same root in terms of like Semitic languages or Latin based languages or whatever it might be. They tend to share a lot of words, but then you also have like, um, what do they call them? Where they borrow the words from another language. Mm -hmm. uh, loan words. Or loan whatever. words. That's it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Loan words. That's it. Yeah. Um, where, yeah, they literally just take it from another language and it becomes part of that language. Um, so interestingly, Somali is actually not a Semitic language. Um, okay. Yeah. So because um, Amharic is, which is spoken in Ethiopia, a lot of the time, like Somali is kind of like in, in the gap. So you would think that Somali would be a Semitic language as well. Mm. But it's actually what we call a Cushitic language, which is a completely different and really, really ancient um, branch of the Afro-Asiatic uh, languages family. So, um, yeah, it's actually not Semitic. But so in terms of its language structure, it's very different to Arabic in terms mm. of its like word order. And um, yeah, there's there's things that I don't really understand them, a lot of them, but there's kind of helping pronouns that you use before verbs and some, some things that are really unusual. Like one is that prepositions come before verbs. So, but they need the verb. Okay. So like in, like in Arabic, for example, we could have the title of a topic, filfunduk, like mm. in the hotel or filbait. We can just have in and then a noun. But in Somali with prepositions, you can't really do that. You'd need to say like, um, you'd need to say like, um, Guriga, Kujoga. It, it needs to be like the house in it is staying. It needs to have staying. It needs to have a verb with it. Mm. It's something in my head when I'm using Somali, putting ver putting prepositions in front of verbs is something that's just really, really hard for me. It's quite alien, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. It's, 
it's a whole different kind of reshape of your language structure. Like, mm -hmm. it, like I think when you make the transition from English into Arabic, the, the word order I think is quite friendly in some ways. Like if, if we want to say, I want to go and play at the park, for example, like the, the word order can match in kind of a, kind of a similar way. A lot yeah. Of the time. And it's, if you're going to shuffle it around, it's yeah, very slightly. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. For example, like Arabic will prefer like verbs at the beginning of sentences, mm -hmm. for example, and often won't need. To, like in English, we use our pronouns all the time. We say I and you and we. In Arabic, they're tied up in the verb, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So there are some differences, but I found in Somali, it's completely, you know, it's it's a very mm -hmm. very bizarre and um and kind of hard to adjust to language structure. I think, or or maybe there are simpler ways. I just don't know of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, I also wanted to kind of. For those who are not aware, so you speak English, Arabic, Somali, and there's also a fourth language you speak, is there not? That's right, yeah. So at home, our main language is British Sign Language. Um, yeah, my, my, my wife, she was hard of hearing when I married her, um, but hearing kind of, it doesn't really improve generally. It just kind of, kind of um, deteriorates. deteriorates with age, yeah. So like, when, yeah, so I, I knew that we'd get to a point where our language at home would be entirely British Sign Language. I knew that. But um, the Somali is part of that story as well, because part of my kind of inspiration and why for learning Somali is so that I can pass it on to my children if my wife's not speaking it, because we use sign language at home. Mm. Um, you know, so like for, for my children to be Somali language speakers, it, it needs any help it can get, mm. really, if, if, if my wife's mainly using sign language. Um, yeah, so, so British Sign Language, which is, has been kind of a really fascinating addition to just kind of my language knowledge in general like when you learn a sign language it it makes you think about how things translate into a visual language that we kind of take for granted in a spoken language like volume for example like we can choose to speak louder if we want someone's attention or we can choose to speak more quietly if we for whatever reason so how does that translate to sign language well you just make yourself bigger you just you just got to be bigger so if you want to shout you just do the sign bigger because <laughs> right. what else have you got you know, and if, if you imagine even like, like on the audio file of this podcast, bigger sounds are bigger yeah. visually. So when you visualize sound, volume is just bigger or smaller. That it, is it's what you just did there, an example of like that versus that, for example. Yeah, exactly. Be... Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then also learning about like deaf culture is really interesting as well. Because like all languages, they have a culture. It's, it's not completely separate to British culture because, of course, it's British sign language. Mm. But there's kind of... Um, routines and things that you would do that just all deaf people who speak British Sign Language or use British Sign Language are familiar with. Like, for example, to get people's attention. Like in, in this kind of context, when we're speaking, we can just say, we turn on the microphone, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the event's starting in a second or whatever. But how does that translate to sign language? So what, what they do in the deaf community is they flick lights on and off. And mm -hmm. people know that that means that something's about to start or you stamp your feet. And so something that is really true about deaf people is because they're not using their ears, their other senses do do become stronger. That's that's not. But when when I say that to people, people think that they're like superhumans. <laughs> they can like see through walls and stuff. It's not like that. But the, the other senses are are heightened. But the sense that I'd say is most heightened is just social intelligence in a sense. Because if you imagine like with us, if I speak to you in a way that's aggressive, then that's the most direct way of me being aggressive. And then, and the less way of me being aggressive is to like roll my eyes or be a bit passive aggressive or something. But in sign language, it's the opposite. If I roll my my eyes at my wife, it's like I've just been like, "Shut up, yeah. you're an idiot." Because <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is her language. That mm. is the most direct way of communicating. So facial them. gestures, expression, body language. They're all... like shouting. Mm. <laughs> like fa facial expressions are like shouting to them. So like my wife, it's kind of annoying. She's got like a superpower of how I'm feeling and stuff. Whereas like sometimes like. Your, your wife or your husband or whatever might be able to kind of conceal their emotions a little bit by being a bit passive about things maybe but but like my wife and other deaf people they're they're really in tune with your body language and your and your facial expressions because that is their language which is which is really really fascinating and I, I think it actually is something I think maybe married couples should practice anyway even if they're not deaf because it has other impacts on your marriage you know like I have to look at my wife. I have to make eye contact with my wife way more than most people make eye contact with their spouses, mm. you know, because I have to. I can't, because a lot of the time you might realize at the end of the day that most of your interaction with your spouse has been, you know, you in the kitchen 
you know, frying an egg and your wife in the living room doing something, you're talking to each other through a wall or whatever. And then like you'll sit at the dinner table and one of you will be on your phone and the other one's looking at their food. Yeah. And you realize that after an amount of time, you've actually not really looked at each other. But like my wife and I really have to look at each other all the time. And it has an interesting um, impact on on how close we are, I think. And it's it's become more the case kind of as as, as her hearing's deteri- deteriorated as well. And I don't know, it's a kind of something interesting that maybe people who even aren't deaf should should maybe explore. Yes, yeah, Pamela, this this whole topic of sign language is fascinating. It's not something that I've heard a lot about, and I'm sure the average viewer, the average listener, or the average person hasn't heard anything about this topic if they don't have deaf relatives or any kind of uh, any. I suppose it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the why, any why that would lead them to look into sign language or to learn sign language. Um, but having said that, you're now a three-time former language learner, a successful language le- learner at that as well, alhamdulillah. Um, and I'm conscious we're, we're approaching the end now. So what, what parting advice would you give to Arabic students or potential Arabic students or language learners in general uh, from your experience having learned them three languages? So, there, I mean, there's a few, but I, I think my best one would be not to take yourself too seriously in it. Like languages, they they really need to be, you really need to push yourself out of your comfort zone. And there's really no way around that, unfortunately. Like, I know it's kind of our job a lot of the time to find ways that we can, as I said earlier, get Arabic into the brains without as, with as little friction as possible. But there are some things that we, we really just do need to do. Um, so the reason why I say kind of not taking yourself too seriously is because sometimes when we talk about languages learning and particularly Arabic, sometimes where we can be quite strict about um, grammar and harakat and we can get quite down into the nuts and bolts, we end up making Arabic more performance than play. And I think sometimes we need to bring it back to a bit of play sometimes. Like when you're producing Arabic in your lessons and stuff like that, like I remember when I was at university feeling really judged when I produced Arabic because there'll be mistakes in there, almost definitely. You know, especially as like a first, second, third year Arabic student on that degree program, that there will be mistakes in there. But because I was because I was self-conscious of that, I, many opportunities where I really could have strengthened my my knowledge of the Arabic language, I shied away from. And I think I lost a lot in, in, in my languages learning experience. So perhaps if I can kind of just be a bit um, transparent about my own journey and where I wish I'd kind of done things a little bit more differently it would be to kind of remind the students and I would maybe even say that your success depends on this in some ways, is to remember that learning languages is more play than performance and not not to kind of, from, from the very beginning, put too much pressure on yourself for everything to be perfect because it won't be. No, it really won't be. In fact, I'll, I'll even tell you, even lots of native Arabic speakers make mistakes with their halakat when they're speaking fusha. Mm. Even native Arabic speakers do. So it's, it's really not wise to put a standard on the students of the language that we don't even live up to with the native speakers. In fact, if people were to listen back to this podcast or learning the English language, that's spot many grammar mistakes that we made in speaking English, right? So, mm. so why do we impose a standard on a student of a language for things to be perfect and not make mistakes and for you to feel silly if you make mistakes when that standard isn't even imposed on the native speakers of it? So I suppose that would be my parting advice. Remember that learning this language, it's incredibly important. And it's really important that you remember that it's more play than performance when you're learning as a student. Mm, I think it's very valuable advice for people to internalize, inshallah, and uh, and try and implement. Um, another way of saying that is just no excuses, right? It's don't make a bigger deal out of it than it is. Uh, just, yeah, don't take it too seriously. Don't let anything, I suppose, block you or prevent you from from taking that step to do something, which is ultimately probably the most important thing that you can do, especially for your relationship with the Quran and and ultimately with Allah. But yeah, so that's uh, that's this uh, episode done, inshallah. And it will be nice to revisit a lot of these topics, inshallah, on a, on a future episode. Inshallah. Um, again, the listeners can can tell us what kind of things they want to hear more about uh, from your story and from the things that we've discussed. Uh, Jazakallah khairan for being with us today. Barak Thank Kisam. you for Thank having barakah. me. Our pleasure. Barak Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.